In this video, we'll be going over the best common magic items, which is the lowest rarity of magic items in the game. A rarity that makes them pretty easy to get a hold of in most campaigns, and is usually regulated to the more useless or favorable items. And at number 10, we have the Orb of Shielding. This item is available from Eberron Rising from the Last War, and it has the ability where it can be used as a spellcasting focus. That isn't super unique, as most spellcasters start off with a spellcasting focus, but there are different variations of this orb, and depending on which one you have, you can activate its second effect, where, as long as you're holding the orb, you can use your reaction to reduce the damage of a spell by 1d4. For example, if your orb is made of Fernian Basalt, then you can use a reaction to reduce fire damage by 1d4, and etc, etc. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of materials the orb can be made of, which allow you to potentially reduce the damage of a specific type by 1d4. And two of the types you can choose allow you to reduce the damage of two different types, as the Kytherian Skarn works on acid and poison damage, and the Laminian Flint works on both lightning and thunder damage. Now, here's what's good about this item. Generally, common items are kind of useless, like the Cloak of Billowing, which basically just allows your cloak to look like it's blowing in the wind, and allows you to have a dramatic Superman pose. That's the type of power level we're looking at when it comes to common magic items. They're not really supposed to be super useful and more flavorful things. So for this item to allow you to take less damage from a type of magic damage is pretty good, especially since there's no limitation on how often you can use this. As long as your reaction is available, you have the potential to just always use the item to take less fire damage, or whatever the other type of damage you happen to have with the orb associated to. And fire damage is common enough where that would be a pretty good one to choose if you had the availability of choosing whichever orb you wanted, or depending on whatever campaign you're running. So being able to reduce the damage of a type by 1d4 is pretty valuable, and is kind of strong considering the power level of common magic items. Made even better by the fact there's no limit to the amount of times you can use it. Now, a little something you'll probably notice as we go through this video, mainly all the useful magic items come from Eberron or Xanathar's Guide to Everything. There's very few useful common magic items from the default Dungeons Master Guide. And at number 9, we have the Feather Token, another common item from Eberron rising from the last war. This item is kind of like a consumable, and that can only be used once, and activates automatically. As when you fall at least 20 feet while you have this Feather Token on you somewhere, it will automatically activate so that you take no fall damage, and descend at a comfortable 60 feet per round. Then once you land, the Feather Token becomes a non-magical item and can't be used again. And since the Feather Token doesn't require an action to do anything, it's honestly just a really nice item to have on your character if you can get one. Because fall damage can unexpectedly kill a lot of players, and you can never really plan for a fall most of the time. So the fact that it doesn't require any action on your part is one of the best parts about the item. There are so few items and abilities in the game that happen automatically like this. It's basically like a deployable parachute in a sense, except better since it can be used on smaller falls as well, and doesn't require you to pull any ripcord. Very useful item, even useful to high level players, which is why it easily makes this list. And at number 8, we have the Pot of Awakening, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This is another consumable item like the Feather Token, where if you plant an ordinary shrub into this clay pot, and then let it grow for 30 days, the shrub will then magically transform into an awakened shrub at the end of the 30 days. After which its roots break the pot and destroy it so you can't use it again. And the creature which awakens from this pot is automatically friendly towards you, and unless you give it a command it will just sit there and do nothing. Now an awakened shrub is a CR0 creature, who is technically able to deal damage, but only deals around 1 damage on average with its attack, that only has a plus 1 to its modifier, so that's not really the main purpose of the awakened shrub. The shrub can move around, and can even take a few hits before going down, as it has 10 health, and is able to speak the language of its creator. And since the shrub has the false appearance trait, where it looks exactly like a normal shrub when it remains still, it could be used as a scouting tool in areas where foliage is plentiful, or just in some buildings that have normal potted plants around. And if you manage to get a whole bunch of Pot of Awakenings, then you could potentially have an army of little creatures who all have a chance to attack. Basically, this item gives you a pet, and you can have all the benefits of a companion from the Find Familiar spell. Well, the non-magical benefits, like being able to provide the help action in combat, and being able to scout things out, kind of. Being able to summon a creature at all with a common magic item is pretty good, and the Awakened Shrub is not a half-bad creature that can be summoned with such a low-tier magic item, which is why it makes this list. Now, whether it's more useful than the Feather Token, 
or the Orb of Shielding is kind of debatable, but there are a lot of uses in combat that an extra companion provides. And also, if you're creative, having a loyal plant which looks exactly like a normal plant can come in quite handy. And at number 7, we have the Perfume of Bewitching, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This is another consumable item, and is basically a magical perfume vial that only has enough for one use. And if you use an action to apply this perfume to yourself, you'll obtain a buff for one hour that basically gives you the friend's cantrip, but without the downside. So it gives you advantage on all charisma checks directed at humanoids. However, with one small downside, and the fact that it only works on humanoids of challenge rating 1 or lower, which is still a lot better than the friend's cantrip, which makes you hostile towards the target after the effects ends. And what do you know, the commoner stat block is considered a CR0 creature, which means the perfume will give you advantage in basically all social situations inside a town, city, or small village. If you run into people who aren't active combatants, there's a good chance the perfume will just give you advantage on social encounters with them. Even nobles are considered a CR 1 8th creature, so it works on important people as well, unless they're secretly a big bad guy who's a high CR rating. And the perfume even has an extra little caveat to the end of it, where creatures who are subject to the perfume's effects are not aware that they've been influenced by magic. So there's literally no downsides to it at all. It's just an incredibly useful common item. Unless you're in a campaign which literally has zero interactions with people inside towns. Or you have a DM who doesn't allow you to barter with their shopkeeps or something. And at number 6, we have the Hat of Wizardry from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This is a common magical hat which can only be attuned to by wizards and has two effects. One of them allows you to use the hat as a spellcasting focus for wizard spells. And the second one allows you to cast any wizard cantrip assuming you pass a DC 10 Arcana check. Now, a DC 10 Arcana check is considered a medium level check, and should be made a lot easier by wizards who want to have high intelligence anyway, which increases their chance to succeed that Arcana check. And this just allows you to have more versatility with your cantrips, as you can take all the useful ones you want, and then once per day have access to one that you might need at that moment. And some useful wizard cantrips include Control Flames for light and the option to attack with it, Create Bonfire for Cooking, or the option to attack with it. Dancing Lights slash Light if you need a flashlight only. Mending if you need to fix something in an emergency. Mold Earth if you need a quick shovel. Or Press Digitation if you just need anything else. As that's a very versatile spell that can do any minor magical effect basically. So there's a lot of nice utility spells that you might want to only use once per day. And did not want to use one of your cantrip spots in order to have access to it. Although, it also has the really nice other feature, where it counts as your spellcasting focus, which allows you to free up a hand for material components. Normally, if you cast a spell that's a material component, which a lot of spells do have, you need to have a free hand in order to hold your spellcasting focus, which doesn't allow a lot of melee fighters to hold two-handed weapons, because then they come into the problem of how do they store the spellcasting focus when they want to use their weapon with two hands, or two-weapon fighting. But with the Hat of Wizardry, your hands are free, which allows you to use your hands for weapons no problem. Although, there's only one subclass of wizard that uses weapons, the Bladesinger, so it's not that useful on other classes that like to cast spells and attack in melee, unless you multi-class into wizard in order to qualify to use this item. But, if you want to free a hand for a spellcasting focus, and can't take the warcasting feat for some reason, the Hat of Wizardry is an option in order to free up your hand. Although if all you care about is freeing up your hand for a spellcasting focus, then the Ruby of the War Mage might be better, since it can be attuned to by any spellcaster and is also a common magic item, and allows you to attach a ruby to a weapon in order to turn that weapon into a spellcasting focus. Although once per day, being able to cast any wizard cantrip is still pretty good as well, so both of its effects are good, which is why it makes this list over the Ruby of the War Mage. And at number 5, we have the Clockwork Amulet, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This is an item that allows you to, once per day, completely ignore rolling for an attack, and instead treat it as if you rolled a 10 for that attack roll before adding the modifiers. Now, the average roll of the d20 for an attack roll is 10.5, so the Clockwork Amulet technically gives you slightly less than the average roll when using it. However, there are situations in which this is actually incredibly useful. With high enough modifiers, like a plus 7 or something, getting a guaranteed 10 would give you a 17 on the attack roll. And if you've already determined the AC of the target, or you just know it has low AC because of something else, then it's basically a guaranteed hit. And there's lots of instances in which you'd want a guaranteed hit. 
like maybe a target is running away at low health, and you know they have less than 17 AC, there would be no chance for them to actually get away if you rolled low. Or if you have some kind of special ammunition that you want to hit, and you're rolling a 10 or higher it would allow you to hit that target. Or you just feel like you're unlucky, and you want one of your attacks to actually hit in an encounter. There's lots of situations in which you'd want to willingly take a 10 on the d20 roll. So many that this item is actually considered too powerful to be a common magic item, especially one which doesn't require attunement. The only restriction is you can only use it once per day. So once per day, you basically get an automatic hit if they have a low enough AC, which is really good for a combat magic item, and why it easily takes a higher spot on this list, only being out by four slightly more overpowered combat magic items. And at number four, we have the Imbued Wood Focus from Eberron. This is an item that can come in the form of a rod, staff, or wand, and basically has the effect to be treated as a spellcasting focus, and can provide a plus one damage boost to a certain type of spell damage, as determined by the type of wood used for the item. So basically like the Orb of Shielding, where the type of material used for the item determines which type of damage it interacts with. So if it's made of Fernian Ash, it will increase your fire damage, and etc, etc. Exactly like the Orb of Shielding, where there is even ones that increase your acid or poison, and ones that increase your lightning or thunder. Now it only gives a plus one damage to a single damage dice. So if you're fifth level caster using Firebolt, which deals 2d10 fire damage, it would only give you a single extra point of fire damage. But if you're using a Fireball, it would only give you one extra damage to that 8d6 roll. But since you only roll the damage one time for all targets hit, it would add an extra point of damage to everything caught in its blast radius, since it doesn't specify that it only works on attacks or with an attack roll, or that it has a limit on the number of targets with that one damage dice. Which means, if you have an item made with Shivara Birchwood, which only affects force damage, then if you used a magic missile, it would apply that one extra damage to all the missiles. Since, based on rules as written, you only roll for damage a single time with magic missiles, and then apply that one damage roll to all missile targets. And what makes this item so good, is that it's incredibly rare for magic items to actually increase the damage of spells at all. Even the Wands of the War Mage, which are basically the spellcaster versions of plus one weapons, don't actually increase the damage of spells, and only increase their chance to hit. So being able to affect spell damage at all is incredibly rare, and you get this plus one damage from a common item, which makes it amazing. Although, it is only one damage, and to only one type of elemental damage. So you have to really hyper-focus on one spell that you want to give the buff to. But that's still really good for a common magic item, which is why it takes a high spot on this list. And at number three, we have the Spell Rot Tattoo from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. More specifically, the first level version of it, as this is a tattoo which contains a first level spell that you then apply to your skin and can use whenever you want, without using the spell material components. Now, technically, a first level spell scroll is also common quality, but the Spell Rot Tattoo has a lot of advantages over a spell scroll. For one, a spell scroll can only be used by a class which knows or can learn the spell in that spell scroll. So if you have a spell scroll for Eldritch Blast, for example, a spell that can only be learned by warlocks, and you're a sorcerer or wizard, then you can't use that spell scroll. And if you can use that class, and the spell you're trying to cast from that spell scroll is a higher level than one you're able to cast, then you have to succeed an ability check in order to successfully cast the spell. So, it's kind of cumbersome to use a spell scroll correctly and basically only spellcasters can use them. The spell rot tattoo kind of ignores all of that. Anyone can have the tattoo, and anyone can use the spell from the tattoo. When you use the spell, the tattoo then vanishes from your skin, so it's a one-time use. And the spell you use has a set saving throw DC of 13, and a plus 5 bonus to its attack roll, if it requires one. The exact same modifiers that a first level spell scroll would have. So basically, the tattoo is just a better spell scroll and one that doesn't require you to reach into your bags in order to pull out the correct spell scroll in order to use that spell. So if you have the spell shield attached to the tattoo, if you're in the middle of combat, you'll just be able to use a reaction to cast that spell like normal, without needing to have a spell scroll in hand. Now, the best spell you could probably have with one of these tattoos would be Find Familiar, since it summons a pet that doesn't have a duration, and basically just lasts as long as it lives. And the familiar gives a whole bunch of benefits in combat, as well as being an excellent scouting tool, and is one of the top choices of spells chosen when people take the spell initiate feat. And if you can only cast a spell a single time, that's kind of the best one to grab. Alternatively, there's a lot of other really good first level spells, like shield or absorb elements for emergencies, 
Healing Word or Good Berry for healing, or Magic Missiles slash Burning Hands for damage. If you want to give a damaging option to a companion or just a really low CR friendly creature, like a commoner, this could allow you to give them a really good spell to cast in combat. And if you have some way to make multiples of these tattoos, it's a really good option to just give, like, everyone in your party one spell. Or if you're the DM, this could be a way to give low CR creatures one-time use spells, and that players won't be able to loot from corpses afterwards, like they would be able to if you gave them a Wand of Magic Missiles, for example. Instead, just give them a spell rot tattoo of Magic Missiles, and it accomplishes the same thing, since they'll probably only be able to cast it one time before they die anyway. So, it's useful for players, but also an excellent tool for DMs to use, in my opinion, especially since it's common quality. It shouldn't be that crazy to throw it on a handful of low CR monsters, depending on the setting of your world, of course. Whereas you can't really do the same thing with a spell scroll since they're so limiting in how and who can use them. And at number two, we have the Masquerade Tattoo, another item from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Now, unlike the Spell Rot Tattoo, this tattoo is not a one-time use consumable item and does allow you to transfer the tattoo to someone else, as Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduced a couple of tattoo items, which require attunement by applying the tattoo like normal, but then when you end your attunement to the tattoo, it actually turns back into the needle, which you can then give to someone else, or loot from a corpse of someone who had the tattoo applied. And what the Masquerade tattoo does is twofold. One of them is the ability to change the shape of the tattoo into any color or pattern, or any shape or size on your body, with the only limitation that it can't be smaller than a copper piece, but it can be as big as covering your entire body. And its other ability allows you to cast the Disguise Self spell once per day. And Disguise Self is actually a pretty useful spell to have, as it basically casts an illusion over yourself that allows you to look like someone else. Just as long as you don't go crazy and try to make yourself look like a gigantic dragon or something. And the Disguise can only be seen through if a creature uses their action to investigate. In which case they need to roll higher than a 13 to see that it's an illusion. And there's lots of social situations in which you'd want to transform yourself into something else. Like running away from a guard in a city, or a criminal syndicate, or for going out and getting information without raising suspicion. Disguise Self is useful, especially since it lasts for a full hour, and you basically only use it once per day if you took it as a normal spell slot anyway. It's not really a spell that you want to cast multiple times a day, and is generally something you only use once in a while. Plus, its other effect can change the tattoo into whatever you want. Can kind of be useful as a disguise as well. You could just have that tattoo cover your entire face if you're going out looking for information, and then just change the tattoo to something more innocuous later on. That way you don't raise as much suspicion. Or you can just have the tattoo cover your entire body and just make yourself bright green. If you really want to stand out in the middle of a crowd to sound a signal to the rest of your party or something. Both of the effects have situational uses, but being able to cast a sky self once per day is definitely the best part of the tattoo. And a common magic item giving you access to a first level spell once per day is really good. As seen by the previous spot which only give you a first level spell one time total. That's kind of why the Masquerade Tattoo takes a little higher spot. It's one of the only items that allows you to cast a leveled spell more than once. And it's actually a useful spell too. And before we go to number one, let's go over a few honorable mentions. Just because there's so many useful common items and I don't know if I'll make another video on this topic. First, we have the Moon Touch Sword, which I'm sure a lot of people thought would be on this list since it's the only magic item sword you can get that's common quality, which also counts as a magic item for getting over the creature's resistances to slashing damage. It also functions like a flashlight in darkness, which is neat, but it's probably the only useful weapon that's of common quality. And there's also two pieces of ammunition, the Unbreakable Arrow and the Walloping Ammunition. The Unbreakable Arrow just simply can't be broken except with an anti-magic shield. Now, this could be situationally useful to throw into the middle of a giant machinery in order to clog up the gears, or just use it to lock a door or something, even though its intended use is just to always have arrows to recover at the end of battle. However, since it's a magic item, it's assumed that you only have the one arrow, and having a singular unbreakable arrow isn't that big of a deal when it comes to recovering your arrows at the end of a fight. It's a lot better if you have 20 of them. That way you never have to worry about your arrows breaking ever again over the course of a regular adventuring day. And the Walloping Ammunition is a type of ammunition that has an extra effect, where a creature hit by the ammunition has a chance to be knocked prone if they fail a DC 10 strength saving throw. It's a kind of easy saving throw for a lot of monsters to beat, 
But having a chance to knock a target prone on a ranged attack is very helpful for shooting flying creatures out of the sky. But it has the same downsides as the Unbreakable Arrow, where since it's a magic item, it's assumed you only have one wall of being ammunition, and it's not very useful if you only have one piece of ammo. If you had 20 of them, then it's a lot more useful, as it basically gives all your shots a chance to knock a target prone. The Moon Touch Sword didn't make this list, since the only reason it's chosen is because it's technically a magic weapon, which is useful, but I kind of want to talk about the effects of the items rather than having a technically magic weapon that allows you to bypass resistances. And the ammunitions are only useful when you have multiples of them, and aren't useful if you only have a single one. And now, let's get into number one. The number one is the Potion of Healing, the only item on this list from the regular Dungeon Master's Handbook. The potion is very simple. As an action, you can drink the potion in order to heal for 2d4 plus 2 hit points. And this item is probably one of the most useful magic items in the game, and appears in basically every single campaign of D&D. You'd be hard-pressed not to find at least one potion of healing in an adventure, and there's a good chance everyone has used the potion of healing at least once as well. Having an on-demand healing is just incredibly valuable in a whole bunch of situations, and the lowest version of this healing just happens to be common quality, even if it is technically a consumable and can only be used once. And funny enough, even though there are other quantities of healing potions, even at higher levels, people will still be carrying around the regular old common quality healing potion, because the baseline healing potion provides is good enough, and if you just need a little bit of healing to come back to battle or something, then you don't really need a higher amount of healing. If a party doesn't have a healer, you could just give them a sack full of healing potions and they'd be good to go. It's a great tool as a DM in order to just let parties pick whatever they want for their party makeup, rather than forcing one person to have to pick healing spells if they don't want to. Because a sack of like 10 healing potions is probably more useful than a healer anyway during early tiers of play, and there's very few magic items that can even heal, and mainly because the potions of healing are more than good enough to kind of fill that niche. So for being one of the most useful items in the game period, the good old potion of healing easily takes number one spot on this list. In this video we'll go over 10 of the best uncommon magic items from official source books in D&D 5e. Generally, uncommon magic items come into play during tier 1 levels of play, which is around levels 1 to 4, and some of these being useful all the way into max level. And at number 10, we have the Bag of Holding. This is a non attunement item which just holds around 500 pounds of crap while only weighing 15 pounds no matter what's inside of it. In most games, you want at least one person to have a Bag of Holding so that you can store all the loot you get in dungeons or out in the open world, or just for a whole bunch of different occasions in which you might need to hold stuff in hammer space. It's just one of the most useful items you can have on you, and it's uncommon, so it definitely has to make this list, just because of its utility. Just make sure you never put a bag of holding inside a bag of holding, because then that causes it to explode and sends creatures to the astral plane. Now, the bag of holding does specify that there's only so much air inside of it, so you can't really store living creatures in there that need to breathe for very long, but that it's not impossible so, one useful thing you can do with the Bag of Holding is just have everyone in your party hold their breath, and then hide inside the Bag of Holding. Then have a druid wild shape into a mouse or a spider and just sneak into the final boss room, and you can basically skip an entire dungeon by just having everyone pop out with the druid wild shape dismissing. So, there's lots of creative uses for this outside of just storing your equipment. Although, it is very heavily advised to ask your DM before you try to do something so clever like the druid party trick. And at number 9, we have the Robe of Serpents. This is a robe from the Storm King's Thunder that requires attunement, and has the potential to have up to 7 brightly colored snakes decorating the robe. And as a bonus action, you can transform one of the serpents into an actual giant poisonous snake. The snake will move on your initiative and will attack hostile creatures for you. The snake only exists for 1 hour until it drops to 0 hit points, or until you dismiss it as a free action. And here's the thing about the giant poisonous snake. It's one of the highest damage dealing low CR beasts in the game, and if you really wanted to, you could summon all of the beasts from this right before boss fight, and just completely destroy any encounter with all the giant poisonous snakes attacking during your turn, as you actually don't use any of your actions to command them, just a bonus action in order to create them during combat. Although there is the big downside where the snakes do not return to the robes after their duration is up. So once you use all of them, the robes are no longer useful. But if you treat it as a consumable item, it's incredibly powerful in the lower tiers of gameplay. Although there's a couple of other better items as we continue on this list that have more longevity. 
But when it comes to burst damage, you can't really beat the power of seven giant poisonous snakes when it comes to low tiers of gameplay, because they can deal about 100 damage in turn on average, and nothing else really tops that when it comes to tier 1 damage output, and that's not even counting the damage your character deals during that turn as well. And at number 8, we have the Wand of Magic Missiles. This is the wand that allows you to spend one charge in order to cast a first level version of Magic Missiles. Magic Missiles allows you to create three dots that deal 1d4 plus 1 force damage each, and the great thing about Magic Missiles is that they can't miss. You can direct each dart to a different target. It has a 120 foot range, so you can hit three very far away targets if you want. So it's guaranteed damage, which is what's so good about Magic Missiles. There are so few things that do guaranteed damage in the game. And the great thing about the wand is that you can spend all of the charges to cast the spell to shoot even more missiles, as it will shoot an additional missile per higher level spell casting of it. And with 7 charges, you can cast it up to the 6th level. The wand also regains 1d6 plus 1 of its charges per day, although if you spend all of its charges, then there's a chance that it can crumble into dust if you fail a d20 roll and roll a 1. Now, what makes the wand of magic missiles so good is the fact that it does not require attunement and is reusable. So, this spell it's able to use is great for pretty much anyone since it doesn't scale or require attack rolls. So you can have a barbarian use it just as well as a wizard. And if you have multiple wands of magic missiles, you can kind of just swap between them. Generally, you don't have multiples of magic items in normal campaigns, but that is something you can do since it doesn't have an attunement. So if you just had a bag full of wands of magic missiles, you could just cast a 6th level magic missile every turn without using any spell slots. And at number 7, we have the Insignia of the Claws. This is an item available from Horde of the Dragon Queen, which has the ability that while you're wearing the Insignia, you gain a plus 1 bonus to your attack and damage rolls that are made with unarmed strikes and natural weapons, which also counts those attacks as magical. Which basically means if you're a druid, you gain the ability to have magical damage for your natural attacks as all of your wild chip attacks are considered natural weapons. If you're a monk, it gives you early access to magical unarmed attacks, and it's the only item in the game which allows druids to gain magical damage for their attacks, so it's super useful for that, with the only downside being it's a magic item from one specific campaign, so there's a good chance you probably won't be able to pick it up. But it's an item so good that it's sought after by even high-level adventurers, for the simple fact of turning natural weapons into magical ones for the purposes of overcoming resistances and immunities, which basically all high-level CR monsters have. And at number 6, we have the Bag of Tricks. This is a bag which has a whole bunch of little fuzzy objects inside of it, and you can pick one out and throw it and it will turn into a random animal which is friendly to you and won't go away until the next day. Now, the animal it turns into is random and determined by the color of the bag you have. All of the bags are uncommon quality, and of the bags, the tan bag is the best in terms of the highest chance of getting a good beast that can deal some decent damage. As when you throw the ball, you have to roll a d8, and then you look at the table to see which animal you summon. All three of the bags have a chance to summon a normal CR0 critter, which doesn't really deal very much damage, and isn't super useful for other things because it's just friendly to you and kind of follows your orders. However, there are a couple of really good ones it can turn into, like the gray bag has a chance to summon a giant elk, which is a CR2 creature that's gigantic and deals decent damage while having a great movement speed. And the great thing about the bag of tricks is that you can summon three beasts per day, each of the beasts lasts for a full day, and if you command them to just attack a single time, then they'll just do it for free every turn without requiring additional commands. The beast you summon with bag of tricks is more useful than the beast summoned through the Beastmaster Ranger and you can have three of them out at a time per day. Bagatrix is kind of overpowered to an extent, if you get lucky with the three creatures you bring out per day. Like in the same bag which has a chance to summon the giant elk, you could also summon a weasel, which isn't as good. And there's a chance you could just summon three weasels that day, which don't really do any damage at all. Although you do need to use a bonus action to command each one to attack, so it might get tough to control in the middle of the battle, but as long as you have time to prep, you can kind of just tell all of them to attack before the fight starts. Or if you just throw the ball at an enemy target nearby, as you are able to throw it up 20 feet away, then it will just kind of attack whatever it lands in front of, since it comes out friendly and will attack appropriately depending on what type of animal it is. So if you throw it out and it turns into a lion, and it's friendly towards you and your party members, 
it's pretty reasonable to assume it will just attack whatever enemy is in front of it without you needing to give it a command. The only reason the Bag of Tricks isn't higher on this list is because it does have that random chance to give you kind of useless animals instead, and one of the Bag of Tricks has a one-third chance to only summon CR0 creatures, which don't really hit very hard. Although the Rust Bag of Tricks has a chance to summon a brown bear, which hits harder than everything else at that CR level. And at number 5, we have Staff of the Python. This is a staff which can only be used by a cleric, druid, or warlock, and what it does is turn into a giant constrictor snake, if you throw the staff on the floor and speed the command word as an action. The giant constrictor snake is a CR2 creature which has a very good constrict ability that can restrain a target and allow all of your party members to have advantage on whatever it's restraining. The snake also goes on its own turn in the initiative order, and you can even control it without using any of your actions. So this staff is also better than the beast from the Beastmaster Ranger. The snake also has 60 hit points, so it's pretty beefy at low levels. In fact, the staff of Python is kind of overpowered at low levels, since a single giant constrictor snake will have more health than an entire party of adventurers at level 1 or 2. And as a bonus action, you can speak the command word to return the staff to its normal form, which will heal the snake to full health immediately. Then you can use an action just turn it back into a snake. So you could use every turn to heal it back up to full by just using a bonus action to convert it back into a staff, and then throw it back with an action to go back into combat. But there is one big downside to the staff, and that's if the snake dies by being reduced to zero hit points, it reverts to its staff form and then shatters and destroys itself. So you can't use it again if it dies a single time, which definitely makes it a risky choice to use in higher level campaigns. But in early levels, the staff of Python is straight broken. So much so that I've heard of some tables that ban it completely from tier one levels of play. It just adds an incredibly strong and useful creature to the turn order that's better than any early level tank. Although once you get to the higher levels, it's nowhere near as useful, and there's a good chance it will die before you have a chance to heal it back to full, since you do have to wait until your turn in order to use your bonus action to convert it back into a staff, and then put it back. Although uncommon magic items are kind of meant for early levels of play anyway, and within those confines, the staff of Python is super good, and a majority of DD games happen in early levels anyway. So, it's good in a majority of D&D games, which definitely puts it at a high spot on this list. And only above the Bag of Tricks, because you're guaranteed to get a CR2 creature from the Staff of Python, while the Bag of Tricks only has a chance to give you a CR2 creature when you use it. Although you get three tries per day, so it's a pretty good chance you get one of them that you want. And you don't have to worry about the Bag of Tricks destroying itself when they die. You just get three summons per day, every day, without really any downsides. And at number four, we have the Weapon of Warning. This can be a weapon of any type and requires attunement, and all the weapon does is warn you of danger. While you have the weapon on your person, you gain two benefits. One of them is advantage on your initiation roll, which is always a plus, and you and your companions cannot be surprised as long as they're within 30 feet of you. In addition to that, if you or your party are sleeping, the weapon will wake everyone up naturally when combat begins, so you don't have to worry about a nighttime attack completely destroying a sleeping party because you weren't able to wake them up in time. The weapon will just automatically wake everyone up the instant the first round of combat starts. The weapon of warning is so useful because you don't actually need to hold it to gain its benefits. You just need to be attuned to it and have it on you somewhere, and you get the ability to get a whole bunch of surprise random encounters, while also gaining the ever-important advantage on initiation rolls, which is a pretty rare thing to get and is super useful in combat. Even if you never actually use the weapon for anything, it's just an incredibly useful weapon to have on one person in the party. Kind of like the Bag of Holding, especially for the effect that wakes everyone up, as you no longer have to worry about someone sleeping through combat encounters that almost killed everyone in the middle of the night. Although, if you're playing a campaign where that never happens, or if you have a feature or ability that makes you not surprised, obviously not as useful, but an uncommon item which gives you all those benefits is super useful, and definitely deserves a high spot on this list. Although the next three are just way more useful. And at number three, we have the Headband of Intellect. While attuned to this item, your intelligence is treated as 19, unless your intelligence is 19 or higher. So it just sets one of your base stats to one away from the maximum, which is all kinds of broken if you're able to pick an uncommon item during character creation, if you're playing a wizard or another class which has intellect as their main stat, you could just dump all your stat points during the character creation process into everything else except intellect, and you would still be a very effective caster for a majority of the campaign. Once you get to the higher levels, you kind of want your best stat to be maxed out, 
But then again, most games don't go into the higher levels. The majority of D&D is played in the lower tiers. So you could grab this headband and just have it equipped for an entire campaign and it would never be a detriment. Although it's much more practically useful in long-term games if you want intellect as like a secondary stat. So that you don't have to worry too much if you have to lose the attunement for whatever reason. Although at low levels or during character creation, being able to nearly max out one of your stats is super good. And it's kind of crazy that an item like this is uncommon quality. But then again, intellect is one of the least used stats, so I guess it kind of makes sense why this one is uncommon. And an item which increases your constitution to 19 is a rare quality. And at number 2, we have the Gauntlets of Ogre Power. These increase your strength score to 19 while you're tuned to them, unless your strength score is 19 or higher without. So basically, just like the Headband of Intellect, only for your strength score. And it's super useful for the exact same scenarios as the Headband of Intellect. If you're able to get it during character creation, you can just dump all your strength stat and still be an incredibly effective fighter if strength is your main stat for dealing damage. Although, an advantage it has over the Headband of Intellect is there are higher levels of this item in the game, and those are the Belts of Giant Strength. The Belt of Hill Giant Strength, which is a rare item, can set your strength score to 21, which is higher than the maximum. So you could reasonably expect to increase your strength score later on in the game with a stronger item, and just never put any points into your strength stat without worry. Assuming you're able to start with the Gauntlets of Ogre Power, and assuming you know you're able to obtain a Belt of Giant Strength, as there's a whole bunch of different ones at different rarities, with the best one giving you 29 Strength. So with giving you a near max stat, and the option to upgrade it later, it's definitely one of the best uncommon magic items in the game. And it kind of makes sense that it's uncommon, since Strength is also not a super power stat either. It's useful for classes that use Strength, obviously, but it's not as universally useful as the other three stats. Dexterity, Constitution, and Charisma. That's why they don't have Dexterity or Charisma items that set those scores at 19. Those two stats are useful for every class in pretty much every game. And at number 1, we have the Winged Boots. These boots do require attunement, but what they give you are up to 4 hours of fly speed per day, and you can use the 4 hours in burst of 1 minute, which basically means you just have a fly speed now, as long as you only use them in combat and don't overuse them outside of combat. But the boots are pretty generous with how they regain their speed. They regain 2 hours of their fly speed every 12 hours that they aren't in use. So as long as you get a rest day, or at least half a rest day, you don't really have to track how much time you have left in the boots if you only ever use them in combat or for short bursts outside of it. If you're trying to fly over long distances of the boots, then you might start having to keep track of how much of the duration you have left. Now, what's great about these boots is the fact that they essentially give you a flying speed for combat purposes without any kind of action or bonus action. You can just kind of activate them at will whenever you want as long as you have duration left in the boots. And it just gives you the fly speed equal to whatever your walking speed is. And the ability to fly is incredibly good. It kind of breaks a whole bunch of encounters a DM might have set up for you. Because you can just kind of fly over them or avoid any traps by just hovering out of their range. You can also completely avoid characters that don't have ranged attacks, which is almost every single beast in the game, and a lot of other monsters that just can't hit flying targets. There's a reason Adventure Leagues bans the use of the Arakoa race, because they gain the ability to fly naturally, which is kind of broken in combat. And you can gain this flying speed in combat with a single attunement slot and an uncommon item in the form of the winged boots. In fact, the flying speed they grant is so useful that these boots are even used in high tier levels of play. And a lot of people pick up the winged boots alongside their very rare or legendary items because they're just that good. The winged boots are a little bit too good, so they get banned a lot in tables. You really have to ask if you even have access to this item in the first place, because I can't imagine too many DMs willingly giving out a pair of these to someone trying to hunt them down specifically. In this video, we're going over the best rare quality magic items from any official source book. And at number 10, we have the Flame Tongue. This is a magic item sword, which allowed you to add 2d6 fire damage to each of your hits, as long as you activate the effect with a bonus action first. And this extra fire damage lasts for as long as you want, essentially, and can be used as many times per day as you want as well. So as long as you have a free bonus action at the start of combat, you get an extra 2d6 fire damage to all of your hits, which is the same damage dice as a great sword, and is almost like having an additional weapon attack every time you strike with it. The item can be any sword, but there's no guarantee that if you get this item in a game, that the DM will give you the sword that you want specifically. 
But if you are able to pick the one you want, you could use this as a rapier or a great sword or whatever. There's surprisingly not too many magic weapons at this level of rarity, outside of the generic plus one or vicious weapons, and Flame Tongue gives this extra damage at the cost of not being a plus one weapon, which is definitely more damage overall, even if it probably has slightly less chance to hit than a standard plus one weapon. Of all the items that will appear on this list, this is definitely the only melee weapon. Everything else will just be wondrous items and one staff. And at number 9, we have the Necklace of Fireballs. This is a necklace which does not require entombment, but that's only because it has a limited amount of uses. Basically, what you can do with this necklace is detach one of its beads as an action, which are allowed to be thrown up to 60 feet away, and when it reaches the end of its trajectory, it explodes as if it was a third level fireball spell. And Fireball is definitely one of the strongest level 3 spells in the game, so it's a really nice effect to have. This can essentially give any player who has access to this to one of your strongest mid-level AoE abilities in the game without having to use a spell slot. In addition, you're able to throw multiple of the beads or even the entire necklace as one action. And if you do, you get to increase the level of the fireball explosion by one for each bead. And the necklace has the potential to have up to nine beads on it when you find it, as it has 1d6 plus three beads each. However, once you run out of the beads, the item is done, so it's a pretty temporary power boost when you have it, but having a potential 9 extra fireballs for anyone who has a necklace is really good, and there's lots of creative uses you can use the beads with. And at number 8, we have the Staff of the Woodlands. This is a staff which can only be attuned to by a druid, and counts as a plus 2 magical quarter staff if you use it as a melee weapon, and it also gives you a plus 2 bonus to your spell attack rolls, so it kind of functions like a plus 2 wand of the war mage, which is really good baseline. In addition to this, it has 10 charges and allows you to cast a whole bunch of druid spells. And they can also use the spell Pass Without Trace, at will essentially, without using any of the spell slots or charges. And Pass Without a Trace gives everyone in your party plus 10 to their stealth check and is super good for allowing groups to sneak past things. So being able to use this as much as you want without spell slots is really valuable in a lot of campaigns. And two of the spells it can cast are pretty high level and useful. You can cast Awaken for 5 charges which is a level 5 spell that allows you to turn a plant or animal into a friendly companion for 30 days, essentially giving you extra action economy. And for 6 charges, you can use the level 6 spell Wall of Thorns, which summons a 20-foot diameter Wall of Thorns that gives all creatures inside of it double difficult terrain, and does a whole bunch of damage to them if they enter or end their turn in the Thorns, which is entirely possible if you summon it on top of a large group. That way they just won't be able to get out of it before dying to the damage. And it also has a whole bunch of other more niche useful spells, so it has a very wide range of useful things it can do, in addition to the baseline bonus to your spell attack rolls. It also has another minor effect where it can turn into a tree, but that's not as useful as casting Wall of Thorns. And at number 7, we have Ring of Spell Storing. This is a ring which can be attuned to by anyone, and basically allows whoever is wearing it to cast spells. And you see, this ring allows you to hold up to 5 levels worth of spells and the spells you're allowed to hold are anything that a creature casts into it. So if you have this thing equipped on a martial class who can't use spells, you can just have the spellcasters in your party cast some of their spells into it, so that they'll be able to use them from the ring without having to have their own spell save DC and attack rolls, as it uses the casters who puts the spells into the rings. But since it only holds 5 levels worth, you can't add 6 level or higher spells to it but even having 5 levels of spells is more than enough to make this thing very powerful, as you can cast Fine Familiar into the ring, which can allow whoever uses it to have the Fine Familiar spell, which is incredibly useful for all kinds of classes, especially melee ones who can abuse the Familiar's help action to gain advantage. They can also be used to hold Healing Word, which just gives another party member who can use a bonus action heal on people, or you could just throw 5 charges of Shield spell into it, which will allow whatever class has it to use shield five times, which is an excellent level one spell that gives you five AC until the start of your next turn, and can be used as a reaction. And this is a really good spell for melee classes to have access to. That's just a couple of uses this ring can have. There's a lot of good ways to take advantage of the ring of spell storing, to the point where it's kind of considered overpowered on certain classes, if they have the availability of some spellcasters in their group giving them certain spells especially giving a melee character access to 5 shields per day. As long as one of your spellcasters just uses some of their spell slots before a long rest in order to charge the ring. 
And at number 6, we have the Amulet of Health. This item simply makes your constitution score 19 while you're attuned to it. And that's it, really. So, this is one away from the max, and it has no effect on you if your score is higher than 19. So, if you decide to later increase your constitution score to 20 in order to max it out, then the necklace will no longer have any effect on you. Now, here's the really good thing about this item. With this item, you can essentially ignore your constitution score, as long as you don't mind it taking up one of your three attunement slots. If you know you can obtain an amulet of health during character creation, because you're doing a one-shot or starting a higher level campaign, where they give you a magic item at the start, you can just use constitution as your dump stat if you decide to take the amulet of health as one of your items. Since no matter what your constitution score is, it will just shoot up to 19. And 19 is really good. It's just one away from the max after all. So it still gives you a plus four modifier. In fact, it's a little bit too good. Where some tables ban items like this because they kind of break the balance of your ability score improvements. Especially with how good taking your ASI at level four is when you level up. And constitution is useful for every class. So this is just a really nice item to have on low constitution characters. And kind of an overpowered one to have during character creation. Which is why it definitely deserves a spot on this list at one of the higher spots, and is only being out by some of the more potentially broken items. And at number 5, we have the Brazier of Commanding Fire Elementals. This item allows you to summon a Fire Elemental as if you had cast the Conjure Elemental spell, and can only be used once per day. Now, the Fire Elemental is really good and everything, but what makes this item valuable is it does not require an attunement. So, once per day you just get a Fire Elemental for 10 minutes. Now, technically, there are three other items just like this one, which summons the other three types of elementals, but the fire elemental is the best of the bunch, as the fire elemental has the fire form trait, where it deals fire damage to creatures that it just moves through, and also sets them on fire. It also deals fire damage to anything that attacks it in melee, and its fire attacks also set people on fire, so it easily does the most amount of damage out of all the elementals, especially since it can do damage by just moving through things. And Fire Elementals have a little over 100 health as they are CR5 creatures. So this is a really good item to have in the early and mid-levels of a campaign. In fact, it's still pretty decent even during high-level campaigns because the item doesn't require attunement. And the Fire Elemental is still pretty beefy at those levels as well. Now, there is a downside to it. The Conjure Elemental spell does require you to hold concentration for the full 10 minutes. So it can break early on damage. And the thing with Conjure Elemental is that the elemental doesn't disappear when concentration is broken, and actually just turns hostile towards your group. So you might have to fight the elemental if your concentration is broken early. Although as long as you just kind of hold back and don't take damage, this isn't a big deal, and you get a super strong creature without an attunement once per day for 10 minutes. And at number 4, we have the Brass Horn of Valhalla. The Horn of Valhalla has a couple of different rarities, and its brass version is the better of the rare versions, as it doesn't require attunement, but as long as you're proficient with all simple weapons, which nearly all adventurers are, you're allowed to blow the horn once every 7 days in order to summon about 9 berserkers on average. And berserkers are pretty beefy CR2 creatures that don't hit very hard, as they only have one axe attack. But they have a high enough health pool where they won't go down to a single AoE either. In fact, they can survive a couple of AoEs before going down as they have more health than most players on average, at around 80 each. And when you summon them with a horn, they stay around for an hour to help you out. So once every 7 days, you can summon around 9 berserkers to help you out with whatever you need, which is a lot more than a fire elemental, and lasts for a lot longer as well. But the cooldown definitely makes it something you can't use every day like you can the fire elemental. Although there's no concentration required to keep the berserkers, Once you summon them, they just kind of help you for the hour before leaving. And this item is kind of so good that a lot of games just straight up don't give it out to players. Because it's also kind of hard for a lot of groups to handle a large amount of NPCs that are attacking with you. In which case, I'd highly recommend looking up mob combat rules so you don't have to roll dice for 9 attacks. And at number 3, we have the Belt of Hill Giant Strength. This is the belt similar to the Amulet of Health, where it just gives you a high ability score. In this case, the belt will set your strength score to 21, which is higher than the maximum. Essentially, attuning to this item will give you more strength than you can get naturally outside of being a max level barbarian. But since it's only 21 strength, it won't actually give you a higher score than a plus 5 to your strength. 
There are different versions of the Giant Strength Belts, and the Hill Giant Strength one is the lowest rarity out of all of them, and grants 21 strength as long as you're wearing it, which is super good. The higher rarity ones just give you more strength, with the best one granting you 29 strength while attuned to it. Now, for the same reasons the element of health is really good, the Belt of Hill Giant Strength can be applied to that as well. If you know you're allowed to get an item during character creation, grabbing this belt can allow you to dump your strength score completely, and still be a fully effective fighter who uses strength as their main damage dealing attribute. As the belt actually gives you more strength than you can get normally, so there is no need to put any points into your strength at all as long as you never unattune to the belt, or as long as you just find a better one later on in the campaign. And at number 2 we have the Helm of Teleportation. This is a helmet which simply allows you to cast the teleport spell from it up to 3 times per day, as it has 3 charges and uses 1 charge per cast to teleport, and regains 1d3 charges every day. Now, teleport is a level 7 spell which is incredibly useful. So useful they can kind of break some game settings as it allows you to skip travel completely in most cases. You see, what it does is allow you to teleport yourself and up to 8 willing creatures to basically any point you can think of, or that you can see in range. And if you decide to teleport somewhere that you can't see, but you are familiar with, there is a chance the spell will fail and have some kind of mishap. And there's a whole rollable table on what mishaps can happen. Basically, you can teleport to places you're very familiar with, or that have teleportation circles pretty easily. Or you can make your chances 100% if you simply have an item from the place you're teleporting to. So as long as you just make sure to take an item from every city or dungeon you explore, you've essentially set a mark on that place that will allow you to teleport back very easily just as long as the item is from the place in the last six months, which most campaigns will fall under very easily. Honestly, being able to teleport three times per day is incredibly good and definitely worth the attunement slot. Unless you're playing some kind of game where it literally takes place in one city and nowhere else, and you know there isn't going to be any travel or just one long dungeon crawl, in which case teleportation might not be that useful. But if there's any kind of travel at all, teleportation is incredibly useful and being able to gain three of them per day from an item is really good. And at number one, we have Darren's Instant Fortress. This item allows you to place a one inch metal cube on the ground in order to speak its command word, which will then grow into a fortress that is 20 feet on each side and 30 feet high, which is nearly indestructible as each of its walls is immune to all non-magical damage and resistant to everything else. So if you summon this thing and get inside, you're pretty safe from a lot of creatures in the monster manual, as not too many of them have magical damage or weapons. The fortress also has arrow slits which give you 3 fourths cover and allow you to attack things outside of it, but this does also mean opponents can attack you while you're inside of it and you're not completely invulnerable. And it has this other useful feature that when the fortress is summoned it expands rapidly and will deal 10d10 bludgeoning damage to creatures that are within its expanding radius, half as much if they succeed the saving throw and then it pushes all those creatures to unoccupied spaces outside the fortress. Now, what's really good about this fortress is that it can create a really good choke point where enemies just can't get past it unless you speak the command word to get rid of it. It can also be used to deal a whole bunch of AoE damage to monsters and instant kill them in most cases, as it easily does more damage than a fireball. And the expansion feature is not limited in its uses. You can use it as many times per day as you want, which seems a little strong. It's also very intentionally vague on how it can function with a lot of its features. So depending on how lenient your DM is, you could use this as a meteor and just throw it on top of things in order to speak the command word to have it drop on someone. Or you could have a familiar fly to the top of a group of enemies and have it expand. You could throw it at something and have it crush people against walls. The item definitely says you have to use an action to place it on the ground and then speak the command word but it's also vague on what constitutes the ground and if you need to speak the command word immediately after you place it. And I'm pretty sure this is intentional. There are so many ways to rules lawyer the instant fortress to your advantage that it can kind of be made useless by your DM if they just tell you no to all of its creative uses it can potentially have. Like if you decide to have a patch of dirt on a mage hand in order to technically count that as the ground for the instant fortress to expand from. Or what even constitutes the ground? Does it need to be on a hard solid surface? Or could it be on top of a wooden plank in the middle of the ocean? Could it be used on a floor in a building? Etc. Etc. Basically, if you want to use it the way it was intended, you'd only use it to place it on the floor in order to have a fortress to hide inside of. If you're creative enough and have a DM who allows it, this thing could do more damage than most classes. 
and could potentially auto-kill enemies if used in narrow corridors. Of course, assuming your DM allows it, I can't stress this part enough. This item has all kinds of arguments online about what you can and can't do with it. Basically, it was intentionally worded kind of vaguely, so that DMs could fill in those gaps. And even using it with its intended use is still really strong, and kind of overpowered for only being rare quality, as it doesn't even require attunement. So it easily earns a number one spot on this list, as the best rare quality magic item in the game. In this video, we'll be going over the best very rare items in D&D, which is the tier just below legendary items, and generally balance for players around levels 11 to 16. And at number 10, we have the Scimitar of Speed. This is a plus two weapon that has the extra effect where you can make one attack with this weapon using your bonus action. Now, normally this effect sounds a lot better on paper than it actually is. A scimitar is only a 1d6 weapon, so it's not very good for most classes, but it does at least count as a finesse and a light weapon, and one of the benefits of a light weapon is the ability to dual wield them. So if you just use your bonus action to do two weapon fighting, you don't really need a high level magic item to allow you to basically do the same thing, only allowing you to add your proficiency bonus to the extra attack. Now, here's where the scimitar of speed shines though. If you're using this on a rogue, and you can use your bonus action in order to attack with this weapon and proc sneak attack like normal, for a rogue, they normally attack only one time per turn anyway, and their sneak attack extra damage can only be applied once per turn. And sneak attack is so much damage that rogues are kind of balanced around getting one sneak attack per turn. And here's where the value of this weapon comes in. You can use your bonus action to proc sneak attack, then use your action to perform the ready action action, which basically states that you can set a trigger for an action or movement, which once that trigger is met, then you get to use your reaction to do whatever you had readied outside of your turn. Normally, a readied action is used in order to spring an ambush, or to wait until someone comes out of cover in order to attack them, or to pull the rope on a trap or something once people get into position. However, what you can do with your readied action is simply state that you wish to attack with your weapon as soon as it's not your turn anymore. That way, as soon as you end your turn and someone else's turn starts, you get off your second attack with the scimitar, and since it's no longer your turn, you get to activate sneak attack once again. Since one little distinction about sneak attack for rogues is the fact that it is once per turn, but it's not once per round. So if you attack someone outside of your turn, you can just use sneak attack again, no problem. And scimitar speed allows you to do this pretty much every turn by just using your action in order to ready an attack as soon as the next turn starts. Although this does use up your reaction in order to do this, which means no attacks of opportunity, but you honestly don't get a lot of those anyway, and this actually turns scimitar speed into a really high damaging weapon for rogues, which is why it's at the complete bottom of this list, but still makes it over a lot of other really good items, since I wanted to have at least one melee weapon on this list. And at number 9, we have Nolzer's Marvelous Pigments. This is an item which contains a couple of paints and a brush, which basically allows whatever you paint to become real, as long as it's only an object. It's kind of like having a 3D printer in D&D, only a magical one. So if you forgot to bring some lockpicks, you can just make some. You can make copies of keys if you have any, if you need some vials, a canteen, a pole, whatever it is you may need, just as long as it's not a magical item or worth more than 25 gold. However, that's not all. It also allows you to draw more ridiculous things, including manipulating the environment if you draw on it. If you're in a dungeon and you draw a door on a wall, it creates an actual real door that will open up into the other room. If you're in a tunnel and you want to make it more brittle so that you can collapse it later, you can just draw cracks into the walls and pillars in order to compromise the foundation. If you want to spy in on another room, you can just draw a little hole or even a window. You can even draw pits, so that you can make a pit trap inside a dungeon for someone else, or whenever you might need a big hole, as it even has rules on how the dimensions of these things works, as you can cover up to 100 square feet with 10 minutes of drawing. It also allows you to draw walls, stairs, tunnels, bridges, pulleys, or pits, a ladder. If you have this item, you're kind of set no matter which kind of dungeon you're inside of, or for any number of other scenarios. This item is a real, rewards players who have a great imagination type item, and is pretty generous with rules as written on what you're able to use it with, just as long as you're not trying to create gold coins or something, as if you make anything valuable, the object will look like diamond or a pile of gold, 
but upon close inspection, it looks like paste, bone, or some other worthless material that kind of looks similar. So if you create fake gold and try to use it to buy stuff, the average shopkeeper will be able to easily tell that it's fake. Although I'm sure if you really want to make money with these pigments, there is probably a way to do it, but you are limited in how much paint you have. So there's only so much you can do if you're trying to convert it entirely into gold. And it's best to use a more creative environment, or as a 3D printer in the middle of a dungeon if you forgot something because the average campaign will probably end by the time you use up all your paint, if only used in these kinds of situations. Unless you use it to create gigantic objects all the time, because those do take up a lot of paint. And at number 8, we have the Mirror of Life Trapping. This is a mirror that allows you to trap people inside of it, as long as you're within 30 feet of the mirror, are looking into it, and fail a DC 15 charisma save. And a creature who's trapped inside the mirror can't escape unless they have some way to travel between dimensions. Which means you can kind of permanently trap a whole bunch of creatures in the game. And the mirror even allows you to store up to 12 creatures, as it has 12 separate rooms for storing different creatures. And while they're inside the mirror, they don't need to eat, drink, or sleep, nor do they age, so you can just kind of keep them in there forever. You can also call the name of one of the people trapped in the mirror in order to talk to them, or speak a second command word in order to free them from the mirror. And if you get more than 12 people in the mirror, then it will spit one of the previous 12 out at random. Now, if a target knows what the mirror does, they do have advantage on the saving throw to not get stuck in it. So as long as the target you're using this on has never met you before, there's a good chance they won't know how the mirror works. The mirror itself basically is a save or die spell. If the enemy target fails to save, you automatically win the encounter if it was the only person in the room. You could use it to steal a big bad boss monster and then just release it inside a volcano later on or into a jail cell in a big city. And as long as you know what the mirror does, if an enemy monster tries to use it on you, you'll have advantage on the saving throw to not get caught in it as well. It's kind of a really powerful item. You could realistically build adventures around the mirror of life trapping. Because if the mirror is destroyed, everyone who's stuck in the mirror gets released, and it only has 10 hit points and an AC of 11, so it's pretty easy to destroy actually. It's also 4 feet long and weighs 50 pounds and is vulnerable to bludgeoning damage, so a couple of rocks thrown at the mirror breaks it as well. So it is strong and can completely end boss fights in one move, assuming they don't have legendary resistances, but also you have to lug around a gigantic mirror in order to use it, which does kind of limit its potential a little bit. Sure, it's strong, but it has some pretty glaring vulnerabilities, which is why it's kind of low on this list, rather than near the top with all the other really strong items. And at number 7, we have the Helm of Brilliance. This is a helmet full of gems, and based on the kinds of gems you still have left in the helmet, you gain a couple of benefits. One of them is the ability to cast a series of spells by consuming one of the different kinds of gems. Two of the more useful spells you can cast are Fireball and Prismatic Spray. As with Fireball, you can consume one of the Fire Opals in order to use the spell from the Helm, which does a crap ton of damage to everything in a 20 foot radius. The Helm will have 3d10 Fire Opals, so you can use it a maximum of 30 times assuming you got the full amount. If you use one of the Diamonds, you can cast the spell Prismatic Spray, which is a 7th level spell that hits all creatures in a 60 foot cone, and has a random effect on each target based on a 1d8 roll you do, where if you roll 1 through 5, it does 10d6 damage to the target of a different type, which is a lot, but kind of expected for a 7th level spell. If you roll 6 or 7, you have a chance to petrify or banish the target to another dimension, and if you roll an 8, you get to do 2 of the effects of the spray to the target. So it has a chance to do 20d6 damage to the target, which is really good on a very rare item. This is why Prismatic Spray consumes one of the diamonds in the helm, and it only has 1d10 diamonds for a maximum of 10 prismatic sprays total. Although, outside of casting spells, as long as it has one ruby left, you have resistance to fire damage with it. As long as it has one fire opal, you can light a weapon on fire in order to deal an additional 1d6 fire damage with your attacks, which doesn't consume the gem like casting a spell does. So as long as you just leave one fire opal inside the helm, you'll permanently be able to enchant a weapon with extra fire damage. And as long as it has one diamond left, it basically acts like an undead sensor, where if an undead comes within 30 feet of the helm, it will shed dim light for 30 feet and deal 1d6 radiant damage to any undead who starts its turn in that area. It does have a downside though, where if you're wearing the helmet and fail a saving throw to a spell which deals fire damage, you have to roll a d20, and if you roll a 1, then the helm blows up and shoots laser beams at everyone. 
Now, this is only a 5% chance to happen, and only on spell damage, so you don't have to worry about using this from a dragon's fire breath or something, since that's technically not a spell. So it's almost just there for flavor, and not an actual detriment. Everything else about the helm is really good, especially the high-level spells that it can cast, and the multiple free fireballs you get from it. And at number 6, we have the Staff of Power. This is a staff with 20 charges that allows you to spend those charges in order to cast a whole bunch of different spells. Some of the highlights including, if you spend 5 charges, you can cast a 5th level version of Fireball or Lightning Bolt, which are two pretty heavy hitting damaging moves. You can also cast Hold Monster or Wall of Force, which are incredible good crowd control abilities, or for a single charge you can cast Magic Missile. And a whole bunch of other actually useful spells. In addition to this, it has a passive benefit of giving you plus 2 to your AC, your saving throws, and all of your spell attack rolls. Getting a plus 2 to your AC is really good for a non-armor piece of equipment. And that's just a bonus on top of all the others. Including the plus 2 to your saving throws, which is also really good to have on top of everything else. And remember, death saving throws count as a saving throw, so you get a plus 2 to that as well. It also has the benefits if you use it as a melee weapon, where it's counted as a plus two quarter staff, and allows you to spend charges in order to deal extra force damage when you hit with it. But one of the more powerful uses of the staff is what happens if you break it over your knee. You see, this staff has an ability called Retributive Strike, where if you break the staff, it explodes and deals damage based on the number of charges still left in the staff. If you're within 10 feet of the creature and it has all 20 charges, that's 160 force damage on a failed dexterity save or half as much on a success. And it's less and less damage the further are you away from the point of impact, and the person who breaks the staff has a 50% chance to travel to another plane in order to avoid the explosion. Otherwise, they take 16 times the damage and will probably die. It is kind of a do or die thing, but being able to deal 160 damage to a final boss of a campaign with one item is actually really good. Even if they succeed the save, that's still 80 points of damage which is a big chunk, but not really worth killing yourself over if you fail the d100 roll. There is a stronger version of this called the Staff of the Magi, which has 50 charges, so it has the potential to deal 400 damage. Although that's a legendary item, at the very rare item level, 160 damage is still a lot, and that's just an option you can use on top of all the other really good things that the staff does. Remember, one of the great things about items that let you cast spells is that it allows you to cast non-cantrip spells with your action if you use a spell as a bonus action during your turn. It also provides some really nice passive benefits while allowing you to cast some pretty good free spells, and it doesn't have a limited amount of times you can use the spells like the Helm does, which is why it slightly beats out the Helm of Brilliance. Even though the Helm of Brilliance can technically cast the better spell of Prismatic Spray, because it's technically limited in how many times it can use it total, whereas the staff regains some of its charges every day while also just providing better passive benefits in the helm as well. And at number 5, we have the Illusionist Bracers. Now, these bracers are from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and have the effect that if you cast a cantrip, you can use a bonus action in order to cast that cantrip a second time. So basically, it's an item that allows you to cast two cantrips in a turn, which is actually really good. On certain classes that love their cantrips, namely Warlocks that build fully into their Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast is a cantrip that Warlocks have, which they can increase the damage of with one of their invocations that allows them to add their spellcasting modifier to the damage of all their Eldritch Blast bolts. And normally, Warlocks don't have the option to cast a spell with their bonus action, but if they're able to do it with the Illusionist Bracers, they get a lot more benefits than pretty much all the other spellcasters if they choose invocations that buff their Eldritch Blasts. Even for non-warlocks, being able to cast two cantrips every turn that you're not using your leveled spells is just extra damage during the turn that you do choose to use cantrips, as not every encounter really needs one of your big fireball spells. So it may not buff your big damage, unless you're a warlock, but it does buff your average damage by quite a bit, which makes Illusionist Bracers pretty strong, and definitely one of the better very rare items in the game. And at number 4, we have the Bronze Horn of Valhalla. This is an item that has a different effect depending on which rarity you use, and the Bronze version of this has the ability that, if a person who blows this horn has proficiency with all medium armor, then they can summon 4d4 plus 4 Berserkers once every 7 days. These Berserkers last for 1 hour and will help you in combat, and the Berserkers themselves are CR2 creatures with actually pretty big health pulls for that low CR, at around 70 on average 
Which means even if you summon these in tier 3 levels of play, like what very rare items are made for, it's reasonable to expect the Berserkers to easily survive a couple of AoEs done by the enemy. As it's not until tier 4 levels of attacks that you have ancient Red Dragon's Fire Brats being able to one-shot a group of Berserkers. And the Berserkers themselves only have one Great Axe attack, which deals around 9 damage on average, and the Horn can summon around 12 Berserkers on average. So if all 12 of those Berserkers hit during their turn, which is very possible since they all have recklessness and can give themselves advantage on their attack rolls, that's around 110 damage from one item during one round. There's a reason this item has a 7 day cooldown. Being able to summon this many beefy creatures at once is big. Although, it can also kind of be cumbersome to control all the berserkers, in which case I'd recommend looking into mob combat rules, that way you can run all the berserkers without having to roll 12 dice rolls for all their attacks. Pretty much all rarities of the Horn of Valhalla have made it into my top 10 items list, but that's because summoning a whole bunch of big beefy monsters is just kind of good, even if you can only do it once every 7 days. And at number 3, we have the Peregrine Mask. This is another item from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, just like the Illusionist Bracers, and while you're attuned to this helmet, you gain a fly speed of 60 feet and have advantage on your initiation rolls. Now, this is another very simple effect. It's just two little things. A fly speed and advantage on one roll. However, fly speed is really good. Items like the Boots of Flying are commonly used alongside legendary items in tier 4 levels of play. That's like around level 20 adventurers. Because obtaining fly speed in D&D is just ridiculously good. There's a reason the Erika race is just banned in Adventures League. Because that race gets a fly speed baseline, which is too strong for a lot of pre-written adventures. And Boots of Flying have a limited duration on how much fly speed they can give you. Whereas the Mass just permanently gives you a fly speed at all times. And it's a pretty good one too at 60 feet. It's basically on this list just for the fly speed. But the advantage on initiation rolls is also good too. Although, if I were to rank their usefulness, the fly speed on this would get a 10 out of 10. Whereas the initiation would get something like a 5 out of 10. Still useful, but nowhere near as useful as flying. Although, still a nice benefit to get on top of the fly speed. And at number 2, we have the Belt of Fire Giant Strength. This is a belt that simply sets your strength score to 25 while you're attuned to it. The maximum a character can get their strength score to normally, outside of capstone abilities, is 20. So, having this item on you literally makes you stronger than your character can get on its own. Which is pretty good, although I don't think I really need to explain this one very much. Generally, being able to increase your best stat to 20 is what you want to prioritize during leveling your character. Although, for the Belt of Giant Strength, you can just kind of ignore that, because you're not going to get it higher than 25. And there are other rarities of this belt as well, with the best legendary variant giving you 29 strength. So there is the option to increase your strength even more later on, but only through getting a better version of this belt. Now, it might not be as fancy as some of the other items on this list, like the Helm of Brilliance or the Staff of Power, but the pure stats of this belt are just statistically better in most cases. You can't really beat just increasing your stat above its maximum. And at number one, we have the Manuals and Tomes of Stats. There are a series of items in the game, which I'll show on screen, which all basically have the same effect, where if you spend 48 hours over a period of six days reading the book and practicing its teachings, you get to increase one of your main stats by two, which also increases the maximum for that score. And once you gain this benefit, the manual will lose its magic, but will be usable again after one century. So basically it functions as a limited item that allows you to boost one of your stats by plus two. Although the fact that it also allows you to go above the maximum of 20 is kind of big. And another distinction to this item, there is no limit on how many times you can do this. So if you're in an incredibly magic heavy campaign and are able to get multiple copies of the Manual of Quickness of Action, for example, you can essentially infinitely increase your dexterity score by plus two. Although if you have a good DM, they'll quickly find a way to limit your access to these manuals because that's kind of broken in unlimited amounts. And most games will never come across a single one of these manuals or tomes. But if you have the option to pick any very rare item, these books are statistically some of the best things you can pick up. As you can't really beat a permanent increase to your character's abilities, which doesn't use any of your attunement slots. Which is why the manuals and tomes that increase your stats easily takes number one spot on this list. And if you were to pick the best one of them, it would probably have to be the Manual of Quickness of Action, 
purely because dexterity is the best attribute in the game. Although the best one is literally just whatever your class likes the best, which changes depending on what class you're playing, obviously. In this video, we'll be going over the best legendary items. Any items in official modules that has a legendary tag as its rarity, while also trying to have a varied selection to choose from, instead of only picking legendaries that increase your damage. And at number 10, we have the Ethrin Mythalar. This is a legendary item from Rhyme of the Frostmaiden, and is a gigantic crystal ball which can be attuned to by up to 8 creatures. And basically, what this thing allows you to do is have a floating city. And while being able to control a floating city is a pretty neat feature, that's not super useful in combat, or for most of the things that go into D&D campaigns. Especially since it's a gigantic crystal ball that you can't move very easily. Unless, of course, you move your city along with it. But outside of its ability to levitate all matter within 500 feet of it, it also has the ability to change the weather in a 50 mile radius, and allows you to immediately restore charges to a magical item you have. Now, the ability to restore charges on a magic item can only be done to an item once for free, and then you can't do it again on that same item until it regains charges on its own. So, here's what's useful about that. There are some items which have charges on them that don't actually have a way to regain those charges. One really good example is an item called the Luck Blade. The Luck Blade has 1d4 minus 1 charges on it when you obtain the item, and each charge allows you to cast the Wish Spell from it but it cannot regain any of its spent charges, and in fact loses the property of holding wish charges after it uses its last charge. And the Luck Blade is a really good legendary item, because having the availability to use the wish spell is kind of game breaking because of how good that spell is, especially if you're able to use it from an item, which doesn't have the risk of making you not being able to cast a spell ever again. And the Aetherin Mythalar allows you to restore the charges to the Luck Blade, assuming it has one charge left anyway. There's also other really good magic items that have charges that can't be restored, because they're supposed to be bounced around the fact that you can't restore those charges. And that's kind of the power of the Aetherin Mythalar. It allows you to basically double the use of these limited items. That's also why it's only at the bottom spot of this list at number 10. It's a powerful legendary item that allows you to control a floating city and change the weather, but those aren't super useful in normal games. But being able to restore charges is useful, but only if you already control other really good items with limited charges, which is why it barely makes this list at the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have the Iron Flask. The Iron Flask is a legendary item which does not require attunement, and has the ability to capture creatures that are not native to the current plane you're in. And then, if you release the creature from the flask, it'll be friendly to you for one hour. So basically, it's like a Pokeball that can be reused as many times as you want without taking one of your attunement slots. Now, in order to capture a creature, it does require the creature to fail a DC 17 wisdom saving throw, but it doesn't require any resources or charges to attempt this. Just an action. So, if you fail to capture something, you can just try again on your next turn. And then keep trying until you eventually succeed. And then if you want to use the creature, you can release it whenever you want especially since it's essentially halted in time and does not need to eat, breathe, drink, nor does it age while it's inside. Although releasing the creature does require another action, so you can't capture a creature and then release it on the same turn in order to have it help you out in that fight. So, it's more practical to use it to remove a creature from a combat, and then maybe use it in a different combat later on, in a situation where maybe it will die in that combat, just as long as you don't give it a suicidal command because it won't follow those commands. Most charm creatures don't, though. Because after the hour is over, then it starts acting normal, and will probably not be too happy that you controlled it and forced it to fight. And yada yada yada, that's not really a huge downside, as long as your whole party just gangs up on it. Or, you can just try to catch it again. With the only downside of the creature has advantage on the saving throw to not be captured a second time. But you can just keep trying until you eventually succeed, since it's still friendly to you until the hour is up. So the Iron Flask basically just gives you an extra companion, and it can be a pretty strong one too, because a lot of creatures are probably not native to the plane that your campaign setting is in, like pretty much all elementals, demons, devils, celestials, etc, etc. And at number 8, we have the Blood Fury Tattoo. This is a legendary tattoo added with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and is an excellent DPS boost to martial classes, as what it does is while you have the tattoo it gives you 10 charges. And whenever you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can choose to spend one of its charges to deal an extra 46 necrotic damage, 
and then regain hit points equal to the amount of damage you dealt. 4d6 is around 14 damage on average, and 10 charges is pretty generous, so you can just choose to apply a charge to every single time you hit, which will provide an extra 140 damage per day, which will also heal you, I might add. It's great if you want to be a life steal melee fighter, and it gives you some staying power. It also gives you an incredible DPS boost, as this is one of the biggest DPS boosts you can really give yourself as a martial class with a legendary item that isn't a weapon. So, you can combine it with another good weapon to increase your damage further. It also has another use for charges, which basically allows you to counterattack, where if the creature damages you, you can spend one charge to make a melee attack against the creature using your reaction, and you gain advantage on that attack roll. And of course, you can use another charge to increase its damage if you do manage to land a hit. The charge for the counterattack doesn't give you the increased damage, but having advantage on the attack is a pretty good bonus as well. Now, the tattoo regains all 10 charges every day, so you'll start each fresh day with 10 charges, which can be used for another 140 extra damage for that day, which is actually pretty great for most campaigns in the average adventuring day. Although, once you hit tier 4 levels of play, and the average martial class is attacking like 4 times a turn, you could theoretically use up all of the charges in one round of combat, but you'll be doing a lot of extra damage in that one round of combat. So, to sum it up, it's an excellent damaging tool for weapon attack based classes. It does also work with ranged weapons that can be used in addition to other legendary weapons and is probably one of the highest damage increases you can pick if you're a weapon based class on this list. Besides maybe two other spots on this list and excluding the game breaking legendary items towards the top. And at number seven, we have the Staff of the Magi. This legendary item has a whole bunch of different kinds of effects, but basically, it's a built-in plus two wand of the war mage and also acts as a plus two quarter staff if you want to hit with it in melee. It also gives you magical resistances while you hold the staff, which means you have advantage on saving throws against spells, which is a very useful feature. Incredibly so that pretty much all boss monsters have this feature. It also allows you to absorb single target spells in order to restore charges to the staff. And it allows you to use charges to cast 13 different spells in addition to six different spells you can cast without spending any charges whenever you want. And gaining extra spells through a magic item is pretty useful because it just gives you more staying power and being able to cast things after you use all of your spell slots. Or it allows you to save your spell slots and gives you access to abilities that might not be part of your class. And when it comes to the amount of spells it teaches you, there are some really nice standout ones like Plane Shift, Invisibility, and more situationally, allowing you access to Knock, Dispel Magic, and even web if you want to lock something down. In addition to a couple of nice damage outputs if you just want to fireball someone. And of the spells you can use without spending a charge, they actually have some pretty decent ones, like Enlarge slash Reduce, Arcane Lock, Detect Magic, and Protection from Evil and Good. And when you spend charges to deal damage, it usually allows you to cast the 7th level versions of those spells. And it has a lot of 7th level utility spells. And having access to so many different kinds of 7th level spells is incredibly useful in all tiers of play, but definitely a lot more useful if you're in tier 3 or below, and basically gives you more varied options in tier 4 levels of play where you might have access to 9th level spells. And finally, it has the ability that can allow you to one-shot bosses, where if you break the staff over your knee and it blows up, it will deal damage equal to the number of charges the staff had when you broke it, as well as how far away the creature is from you, for a maximum potential of 800 force damage, assuming they fail a saving throw. And 800 force damage is enough to kill pretty much all creatures in the game, unless they are immune to force damage, which very few creatures are. It's one of the least resisted and immune types of damage in the game. And good news, you have a 50% chance to instantly be teleported to a random plane of existence when you break it, so there is a chance you won't die when you destroy it, but you do lose the weapon in the process, so it's really something you can't use very often, uh, or just once. But it can allow you to one-shot a final boss. So for having the utility of 7th level spells, granting you magical resistance, and of course having the potential to one-shot a final boss, it definitely makes this list. But some of the higher options are just a little bit more useful, and don't require you to destroy an item in order to make use of its best damaging effect. And at number 6, we have the Cloak of Invisibility. This legendary item is nowhere near as fancy or long-winded as the Staff of the Magi, and only really has one simple effect, where 
You can use an action to pull this cloak over your head in order to cause you to become invisible. You have two hours of invisibility with this item baseline, and you can choose to only use the amount of invisibility in increments of one minute. And more importantly, the invisibility granted by this cloak does not break during combat. And since you can choose to use it in increments of one minute, this basically gives you permanent invisibility during combat, which means permanent advantage on attack rolls and disadvantage on rolls against you, assuming you're going against enemies who don't have true sight spell or some other way to see invisibility. And of course, invisibility is just useful outside of combat as well for sneaking around. And since you're allowed to use it in increments of one minute, that gives you 120 uses of it before it runs out of invisibility, and then needs a cooldown period of 12 hours to regain each hour. And because of the ease of access of invisibility with this item, it's one of the most sought after legendary items in Adventures League, mainly because some of the top spots are unavailable because of all the rules in Adventures League, but it's just so useful for pretty much all classes, especially martial classes who gain advantage from the invisibility, and it's definitely one of the strongest legendary items in the game. Whether it's stronger than something like the Staff of the Magi or even the Blood Fury tattoo is probably up for debate though, but if you can already cast all of the spells from the Staff of the Magi and you don't really care about having extra uses of those spells, Cloak of Invisibility is probably a better option. And also it combos very well with the Blood Fury tattoo, since you'll be able to land more attacks with all the permanent advantage. And of course the out of combat uses of having invisibility whenever you want without having to cast a spell for it. And at number 5, we have the Scroll of Tarask Summoning. This is an item from Rime of the Frostmaiden, and what it does is allow you to summon a Tarask to an unoccupied space you can see within one mile of you when you read the scroll. Now, the Tarask is a CR 30 creature, and you don't actually gain control over the Tarask when you summon it with the scroll, which is where the one mile range comes into play, as what you do with the scroll is summon it in front of an enemy stronghold. And the Tarrasque will just go in and kill everything because it's hostile to everything when it's summoned except to itself. Or if you're fighting an enemy who's on a secluded island, just summon the Tarrasque there and will eventually kill everything, since it is a pretty destructive creature that will destroy everything in its aggressive path. If anything, the big problem of the scroll is the fact that there's no duration on the Tarrasque. Once you summon it on top of an enemy and it kills everything, then you kind of have to deal with it yourself. Otherwise, it will wander to the nearest populated city and destroy everything, and keep going until it reaches zero hit points. As, thankfully, it does de-summon once it reaches zero hit points, so you don't have to worry about the nature of whether a Tarrasque can be destroyed or not. So, having this scroll is like having a one-time use snook. Use it on something that you want to destroy, assuming they don't have a way to just defeat the Tarrasque themselves. The Tarrasque is not as dangerous in 5e as it was in previous editions, so if you try to use it on a tier 4 level big bad evil guy, there is a chance they'll have some high level spellcasters who can make short work of it. Although, so many Tarrasque on anything in tier 3 and below is guaranteed to destroy everything. Now, as of the rules of using scrolls, generally, scrolls are one time use items, so you won't be able to use it again, even though the scroll for this particular item doesn't say it's unusable afterwards. And since it's only a one time use thing, and you have no control over the creature summoned, it is still very strong, but definitely drops down the rating a little bit compared to some of the higher legendary items because of its big drawbacks. And at number 4, we have the Ayun Stone of Mastery. While you're attuned to the stone and it circles around your head, as per the rules of Ayun Stones, it increases your proficiency bonus by plus 1. Now, what's so good about this item is the fact that there's almost no way to increase your proficiency bonus normally. It just increases as you level up, and that's it. And the proficiency bonus is one of your most used stats, as it applies to pretty much everything that you use normally. And a plus one in your proficiency bonus increases your chance to hit by one, it increases all of your saving throws that you're proficient in by one, it increases your proficiency skill checks by one, and more importantly, it increases your spell save DC by one. Being able to increase your spell save DC is incredibly rare. Not even the Staff of the Magi increases your spell save DC. And this is in addition to all the other increases you get. Increasing your proficiency bonus by one is by far the most powerful stat that you can increase, and there aren't really any other magic items that can do this. The only downside to this item is that that's all it does. It requires one of your attunement slots, and of course the item can technically be destroyed. Although enemy creatures would specifically have to target the stone and try to destroy it, and they can also attempt an acrobatics check in order to grab it, 
So, depending on your DM, this could be a non-issue or an actual downside to the item. If we just ignore the possible downside that the item can be removed or destroyed, it's not easy to remove or destroy it anyway. The fact that it's a plus one to proficiency bonus is super good, and is one of the few items that's just good on every single class. And at number three, we have the Scroll of the Comet. This is another scroll from Rime of the Frostmaiden, and this one allows you to summon a comet to a location one mile away from you, which on impact deals 165 force damage to all creatures in a 500 foot radius, or half as much on a success, and also destroys all structures and non-magical items caught in its radius, while also leaving a 50 foot deep crater afterwards. So just like the scroll of Terrasse summoning, this can be used as a one-time nuke to destroy an enemy stronghold. Although unlike the scroll of Terrasse summoning, you can control this one a lot better with the precision this one gives you. With the Terrasse Skull, it summons a creature that you can't control, which is hostile towards everything, one that you might have to kill yourself later on if it's a little bit too effective at its job. With the Scroll of the Comet, you don't really have to worry about the fallback, as it just kind of destroys everything and deals enough damage to kill all but the highest health enemies, as you can just go in there and finish them off afterwards. This is basically the D&D equivalent to having a nuke in a more literal sense, than the Scroll of Terrasse Summoning. And at number two, we have a dual spot with the Luck Blade and the Ring of Three Wishes. They're both on here for basically the same thing. They allow you access to the wish spell up to three times through an item. And like I explained a little bit earlier on, being able to cast a wish through an item is better than casting it as a spellcaster, because you don't have to worry about the side effects of never being able to cast a spell again if you do something creative with it. And wish can be as powerful as your DM allows it to be as it can be used to summon an army of giants to destroy the world, for example, an unlimited amount of wealth to buy whatever you want, or to just make yourself king of a nation. And all of this is technically possible by rules as written, thanks to the wording of the wish spell. Although, most DMs will say no to those kinds of crazy requests. But, not all of them. And it's entirely up to the DM to allow what exactly you get out of the wish spell. It's a pretty common thing for most DMs to just monkey paw every wish, though. Outside of that, the normal uses of the wish spell that your DM can't monkey paw are pretty good too, like being able to cast any 8th level or lower spell for free without a cast time, which means a free cast of Simulacrum, which basically gives you a clone that you'll be able to use all of your actions, and normally requires 1500 gold and a whole bunch of items in a 12 hour cast time, plus a 7th level spell slot. You can also potentially create an item that's 25,000 gold or lower in value and non-magical, you can heal up to 20 people to full health. You can grant up to 10 people permanent resistance to any type of one damage. Or grant to 10 people immunity to a type of damage for 8 hours. So, if you have 3 uses of the Ring of Wishes, you could just give your entire party resistances to 3 types of damage. And then, if someone has the Aetherin Mythalar, you could restore it again for 2 more wishes for potential 5 permanent resistances because the Ring of Three Wishes does become non-magical if it loses its last charge, so you have to recharge it while it still has one charge left. The Luck Blade is kind of similar in that matter, except it also has an effect where if it no longer has the ability to use Wish, it's still a plus one dagger and has one luck charge per day. And lastly, one of the things Wish allows you to do is rewind time, to redo a roll with advantage that happened within the last round. Now, technically, the only thing you can get away with is an eighth level or lower spell without Monkey Paw shenanigans, but the other things I explained are reasonable suggestions that a wish spell can do without requiring monkey paw shenanigans that are listed in the wish spell, but technically they aren't immune to the monkey paw stuff if your DM really loves to do that. And because of just how much value you can gain from having the wish spell, the item which allows you to cast it are definitely some of the strongest legendary items in the game, and still probably better than the number one spot. And at number one, we have the Moon Blade. This is an item which is basically an artifact, but is technically classified as a legendary item because of how it works, and it makes sense once I explain it. Basically, the Moonblade has a number of properties depending on how many previous users were attuned to the Moonblade in the past, and while there is a guideline that it typically serves 1d6 plus 1 masters in the past, technically, you can have it start with as many properties as you want if you're the DM handing it to a player. So you can choose to make this thing as weak or as strong as you think is appropriate for your story. So assuming it has all of its properties, and you want to load in as many as possible to make this thing as incredibly strong as possible, it's a plus three weapon, 
which gives you a plus two to your initiation. It counts as a finesse weapon for rogue sneak attacks. It has a throne property. It has a crit range of 19 to 20. It does an extra 1d6 damage to a specific type of enemy, while also dealing an additional 1d6 damage baseline. It allows you to bonus action blind a target. It allows you to summon a shadow minion, and can function as three other magical items, including the Defender, a Ring of Spell Storing, and a Vorpal Sword, two of which are legendary items themselves. So, this thing can be jam-loaded with effects. Or not. It's one of the few items which allows the DM to make it as strong as they want. By rules as written, anyway. Technically, a DM can just do this for any item if they decide to homebrew it. Now, there is a downside to this blade. It can only be attuned to by an elf or half-elf of neutral or good alignment, and the Moonblade technically is a sentient weapon that only attunes itself to a creature that it deems worthy. And also, the Moonblade can end its attunement to you if it thinks you're corrupt or at odds with preserving elven kind. Although for this video, we're assuming you meet the requirements to attune to the Moonblade. And if you're able to attune to this item, and your DM jam loaded with a whole bunch of properties, it's one of the strongest legendary items in the game. Especially since it literally functions as two other legendary items. Or it can, potentially. That's kind of why I don't have the Vorpal Sword on this list. It's a pretty good legendary weapon for most martial classes to have, because of the ability to instantly kill things. But the Moonblade can just kind of have that as one of its effects. Although, even with how many special abilities this blade can possibly have, it's still probably not better than just having access to an item wish spell. So, it could be debated whether this thing is better than the Ring of Three Wishes or the Luck Blade. Now, Artifact is the highest level rarity of items in the game. There's a good chance you won't ever see an Artifact while playing an average game, or your whole campaign can be about just obtaining a single Artifact. With that in mind, there aren't very many official ones in game, but there are enough to talk about the 10 best ones nonetheless. And at number 10, we have the Mighty Servant of Leko from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This artifact item is kind of like one of those robots from Pacific Rim, where it requires two pilots in order to control a single mech. Although, this artifact doesn't require two pilots, but it can have two of them, as it can be attuned to by up to two creatures at the same time. And in order to use it, you have to climb inside of it and control it, and the construct can move 60 feet a turn and attack with its destructive fist at range or in melee, which hits for around 36 damage on average, with a plus 17 to its hit modifier, so its stats are almost like that of an ancient dragon. It also has around 310 health and a whole bunch of immunities and resistances to damage. And since it can be controlled by two people, the construct basically gets to move two times and attack two times during a round, as each of its drivers are able to independently control the creature during their turn, and use their action in order to make the construct perform one of its actions, and they're able to have it move its full 60 feet of movement. Now, the damage this thing is able to accomplish is not better than what a player can do in Tier 4 levels of play, which is why it's kind of low on this list. Sure, it does give you a cool robot to control that does hit pretty hard for a machine, and even has a nice distinction of dealing triple damage to objects, but you can deal more damage than this thing yourself if you're level 17 and above on pretty much any class. But if you're in Tier 3 levels of play and below, or below levels 16, and somehow get your hands on this artifact, that's when it becomes a lot better and more useful. It also regains 10 hit points every turn, cannot be destroyed by normal means, and has a really bad negative effect, where if it goes below 50% health, it tries to mind control both of its occupants, and each attuned creature must succeed a DC 20 wisdom saving throw, or be charmed for 24 hours. That's a pretty hard wisdom save for even tier 4 levels of players to make. And while charmed by the robot, the creatures will force you to go on a destructive spree destroying objects, structures nearby, preferably using the robot itself if possible, but that's not a requirement. The machine also has a self-destruct sequence which isn't actually known by the people who attune to it, and has to be given to the players by the DM in some other way. And if you spend three actions trying to initiate this self-destruct sequence and you know how to do it, you can have it blow up for around 261 damage in a 100 foot radius but it also kills the occupants inside, leaving no remains. And that doesn't actually kill the construct, as it will come back about five days later and slowly rebuild itself, kind of like the Iron Giant. However, if you're trying to initiate its self-destruct sequence, it will use its ability to mind control you by forcing the DC-20 wisdom save. So, all in all, it's a neat mech that you can control and have it take around 150 damage before it initiates its mind control procedure. 
And with how much resistances and damage immunities it has, plus healing 10 points every turn, it can take quite a beating before it reaches that point. And at number 9, we have the Sword of Kas. This is a plus 3 weapon which has a built-in defender property, which is a legendary item in of itself, that also, once per day, allows you to cast Finger of Death, with the DC of 18. Or, I guess technically, it does have two other spells that can allow you to cast. You can choose to cast Call Lightning or Divine Word, but Finger of Death is one of the better options of the three spells the sword can cast, as it can only use one of them per day. Outside of being able to cast a 7th level spell for free, it also has an increased crit range, deals bonus damage to undead, and gives you a plus 1d10 bonus to your initiation. So it has the potential to give you a plus 10 to an initiation roll, which will almost guarantee that you go first in a round, which is great in everything, but the sword does also have a downside, where if you draw the sword, you need to make something bleed within one minute. Otherwise, the sword will take control of your character if you fail a DC 15 charisma saving throw, where it then forces you to bathe in blood. But if you succeed, you only take 3d6 psychic damage instead. Now, the sword itself is decent enough, but it is beaten in damage by some legendary items. So if you're trying to increase the damage of your character by the most, the Sword of Cast is not going to be what you're looking for. As the Moonblade technically can give you way more damage than this artifact item, or even the Blood Fury tattoo. But surprisingly, a lot of the artifact weapons don't increase your damage by very much anyway. A lot of them focus on just giving you a whole bunch of unconventional effects, or some game-breaking ones. And this one doesn't really have any game-breaking effects, but it does have a lot of nice bonuses stacked up. The free use of a spell once per day, the higher crit range, the increased initiation, the ability to grant you 3 AC with its defender effect, and of course, the effect that you gain from the minor and major beneficial properties. And the downside is actually pretty tame when compared to some of the other downsides of artifact items. I had to exclude some of the really good ones off this list because their downsides were just so bad like the Crook of Rao, an artifact that has a downside where you have a chance to open a demon portal that summons a constant swarm of demons every six seconds for 18 years. And I think being forced to occasionally kill something is not as bad as opening a demon portal for 18 years. And at number eight, we have the Book of Exalted Deeds. This is one of the few artifact items which only has beneficial properties and no negative ones which allows you to have two minor and two major beneficial properties. And the majors are kind of strong. For those of you who don't know, most artifact items have this property on them where you can roll for minor and major beneficial or detrimental properties. Some minor negative properties can be simply things like you smell bad or have an increased weight, to a, a little bit more extreme things like making all animals hostile towards you or making you blinded when you're not near your artifact. And the major negative properties are even worse. Some of them can change your alignment or make an entire species of creatures hostile towards you. Although the beneficial ones are all pretty great, especially the major ones. Those can give you benefits like having the regeneration skill, where you heal for 1d6 hit points at the start of each of your turns as long as you have one hit point. Or it can allow you to cast a random spell attached to the item that you can use once per day. They can permanently increase your walking speed by 10 feet, or it can increase the damage the item deals. So, only having four beneficial properties is excellent. I don't think any other artifact shares this distinction. All of them have a little bit of downsides when they give you beneficial properties. Now, Book of Exalted Deeds isn't on this list for just having good properties. Although that is a huge bonus in its favor. It also gives you a plus two to your wisdom score and allows you to take it over 20. As this bonus can pull you all the way up to 24 potentially. It gives you a halo effect, which will give you advantage on persuasion and intimidation checks, plus disadvantage to fiends and undeads who try to attack you within 10 feet. And if you're a paladin or cleric, any paladin or cleric spell you cast will count as if it was cast one spell level higher. Although it does have a downside, the book requires you to perform a good act once every 10 days. The book is also only usable by good aligned creatures, and you can lose a tomb into it if you willingly commit an evil task. So if your character is forced into a morally gray situation where they have to do something evil, the book can choose to unattune to you because it doesn't like what you did. Or if you just don't go out and be proactive in doing good deeds once every 10 days. But honestly, as far as negative effects go of an artifact, that's pretty minor. So having a nice stat increase above 20, only having beneficial properties, and the ability to have advantage on charisma-based checks with good creatures 
it's a pretty decent artifact item to give to a good aligned character. Even if it's a little bit weak when it comes to actual damage increasing benefits. And at number 7, we have the Demonomicon of Igwil from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This book has the ability to allow you to cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter an unlimited amount of times, which is a pretty decent first level spell to gain the ability to cast infinitely. It also has a lot of abilities related to fiends, where it allows you to deal max spell damage against fiends. If you use the spell's Magic Circle or Planner Binding against a fiend, it allows you to do so at 9th level, and giving that fiend disadvantage on saving throws against both of those spells. It allows you to summon fiends, it allows you to capture a fiend once a day, and it allows you to plane shift into layers of the abyss. Although it does have a pretty nasty downside, where the book will always have 1-4 to four demons already inside of it when you first get it, and each day that you spend a long rest on the same plane of existence as the book, the highest challenge rating demon in the book will attempt to possess you on a failed DC 20 charisma saving throw. And you can't release the demons yourself in order to manually kill them, so you can't really have the book without this downside. Unless your DM is nice and gives you the book without any demons inside of it. You can also trap fiends inside the first 10 pages of the book with its containment ability, as long as you use the book on a fiend that's currently trapped inside a magic circle spell. The book has 8 charges and allows you to cast a number of spells by spending the required amount of charges. It allows you to spend 1 charge to cast magic circle, and if you're using it to name fiends, it allows you to cast it at 9th level. And what Magic Circle does is it basically creates a barrier in a 10 foot radius, which makes it so creatures of your designated type cannot get inside the barrier, and it has to pass a charisma save in order to teleport or plane shift inside. And while you're inside the barrier, creatures of the chosen type have disadvantage on attack rolls against you, you can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by creatures of those types. You can also choose to inverse the casting of the spell, which will prevent creatures inside the field from leaving in the same way. Although Magic Circle has a 1 minute cast time, so it's pretty difficult to actually contain a demon inside, since you basically have to keep them controlled for a full minute, unless you can cast it instantly with this item, as it does say you can use the spells with a single action, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And when you cast at higher level spells, it increases the duration of the spell, for a maximum of 7 hours of cast at 9th level. So, what you can do in order to circumvent the downsides of the Demonomicon is just cast Magic Circle before you take a long rest, as you're immune to being possessed by creatures of your designated type. And the book allows you to cast it at 9th level if you choose Fiends. Plus, you'll get all the charges back the next day anyway. So as long as you just have one charge of the book before long rest, you can kind of circumvent the downside. Now, it also allows you to cast Planner Binding at 9th level which is a spell that allows you to basically mind control a monster, and has a duration that's based on the increased spell level. And if you cast it at 9th level, it allows you to control a fiend for up to a full year, who has disadvantage on that saving throw, which is a DC 20. A very hard saving throw to actually pass normally. And being able to dominate a fiend monster for a full year is pretty useful. So if you're in a campaign that has a lot of fiends, this book is going to be incredibly overpowered which is kind of reasonable for an artifact item, considering the power levels we're dealing with here. Now, because of its really nasty downside if you don't find ways to circumvent its downside, it is kind of lower on the list, but still makes the top 10 nonetheless. And at number 6, we have the Axe of the Dwarvish Lords. This is a plus 3 battle axe, which basically functions as 4 other magic items all at once, where it has the properties of the Belt of Dwarven Kind, the Dwarven Thrower, the Sword of Sharpness, and the Stone of Controlling Earth Elementals. Now, with the benefits of all these items, basically it gives you a plus two to your constitution score, advantage on charisma checks with dwarves, advantage on saving throws against poisons as well as resistance to poison damage, dark vision, the ability to cast the Conjure Elemental spell, summoning an Earth Elemental once a day, the ability to know the dwarvish language, the axe gains the throne property, which allows it to deal an extra 1d8 damage if thrown, and the weapon will fly back to your hand afterwards. It allows you to deal maximum damage to objects. You can have the item glow if you speak its command word, and if you roll a 20 with its attack roll, the item will deal an additional 4d6 slashing damage. And those are just the properties it gains from those four magic items, plus a downside of a 50% chance to grow a full beard every day. In addition to those effects, it has some artifact properties, like pretty much all the other artifacts. It allows you to teleport if you touch the axe to a dwarven stonework, and gives you some nice benefits if you attune to the item while you are a dwarf. 
where it basically boosts your racial abilities, granting you immunity to poison damage, increasing your dark vision by plus 60 feet, and giving you proficiency in artisan tools related to blacksmithing, brewing, and stonemasonry. And just like all artifacts, it has downsides, where there's a curse associated to the axe, where if you're attuned to this item and you're not a dwarf, each passing day your physical appearance and stature will become more dwarf-like, where after seven days you'll fully look exactly like a dwarf, although you don't gain any of the dwarf's racials, nor do you lose any racials you have. But you can undo it with a greater restoration or remove curse spell. So, as long as you have access to those two spells, you can keep just undoing the curse if you don't want to look like a dwarf. And seeing as a downside is purely cosmetic, this is one of the lightest downsides out of all the artifacts so far. So, for having the properties of four magic items, including being a plus three weapon, and giving you a super boost to your racials if you're a dwarf, it's a pretty decent weapon, which unfortunately is beaten out by some legendary items when it comes to increasing your damage on martial classes. It has lots of utility though. You can possibly get a nice damage boost from one of its beneficial properties, but if all you care about is increasing your damage as a martial class, it does lose out to the Moonblade or Blood Fury tattoo. Two lesser legendary items. And at number five, we have the Teeth of Dalvinar from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This artifact item has the ability to grant a character a few effects with only one attunement, and really good effects too. As long as you're attuned to the whole pouch of teeth, you're able to implant a number of teeth equal to your constitution score plus one, for a minimum of two teeth. So if you have a constitution score of 20, you'll be able to have six teeth implanted. And what you can do is reach into the pouch and pull out a tooth, where you can then choose to implant the tooth into your mouth or plant the tooth into the ground. And depending on which effect you choose to activate, you can roll from a table to either gain a permanent effect if you try to plant the tooth into your mouth, or summon a creature if you plant the tooth into the ground, which will be friendly to you for 10 minutes. And don't worry too much about planting the tooth into your mouth. It will just cause one of your teeth to fall out and then graft itself into your mouth to be an exact copy of that tooth. And the effects of the tooth are one of 20 from a rolled table, where you can either have eight charges of revivify, which will cast itself automatically on yourself when you die, or gain three charges to heal and cure diseases and poisons every day, gain the ability to essentially read minds permanently, gain a 4d6 unarmed attack bite, a 9th level counter spell once a day, the 8th level spell dominate monster once a day, a flight speed and the ability to cast a tech magic at will, immunity to fire damage, immunity to lightning damage, the ability to use an ancient red dragon's flame breath attack, the ability to call on a divine intervention, and probably one of the best abilities, the ability to cause an extra 3d10 damage to a target who hasn't taken damage in the combat yet. Which, if comboed with a spell that hits multiple times, like a magic missile spell cast at 9th level, then it can deal some ridiculous damage, as it stacks with all of those instances of damage. Well, kind of. There are some complicated rules, but it should work with magic missiles. Also, giving a monk a 4d6 unarmed bite is really good as well. So are a lot of the other abilities. Alternatively, if you don't want to attune to a tooth and gain one of the potentially really good abilities, you can instead plant it into the ground in order to summon a monster that will be friendly to you for 10 minutes, with some really good standouts being an ancient blue dragon, a pit fiend, or a Tarrasque. Although the Tarrasque only gets summoned for 1d4 rounds, ignores you and your commands, and then vanishes. So the summoning of one of the ancient dragons is probably one of the better ones, but you also have a chance to summon not-so-useful creatures like a single commoner or nine normal cats. So if used to summon creatures, you can potentially get some really good allies to help you for 10 minutes. And if you choose to try to gain one of the effects, you can have the potential to gain a really good one. These teeth seem like a great item to give to a uh, lower adventuring level party, with some of the abilities being really good at high levels too, like the Mill Road Murderer's Tooth that gives you an extra 3d10 damage in targets that haven't taken damage in the combat yet. Now. There are some downsides to the teeth. Some of the effects have more negative effects than positive ones. Like one of them gives you scales and a plus two to AC, but makes you perform a constitution saving throw every time you sleep, or else you take one level of exhaustion. And the tooth which grants you a ninth level counter spell every day requires you to use that counter spell every day. Otherwise you lose 2d10 health permanently, and then die if you reach zero health in this way. So potentially having up to six random effects is good, but even if you just use them to plant teeth into the ground to summon monsters, 
a majority of the options are temporary great allies, which makes it an excellent artifact item, if a little bit random. And at number 4, we have the Wand of Orcus. This one can basically allow you to summon a horde of zombies once a day. It also has good stats and a manageable downside. The wand can act as a plus 3 base, which deals an additional 2d12 necrotic damage if you use it as a melee weapon, which is equivalent to the damage of two great axe attacks, the highest damage dice of a normal weapon. So it's a pretty competitive martial weapon, despite the fact that it's a wand, and mainly used for wand-like things. It also grants you a plus 3 bonus to your AC, the highest amount of AC you can be granted from an item, and it allows you to cast some nice spells, seeing as it's a wand and everything. It has 7 charges and allows you to cast a number of spells with a DZ18 saving throw by spending some of those charges, with standout ones being Circle of Death, which is a really nice AoE, or Finger of Death, which is a really high damage dealing single target nuke. And of course if you spend 4 charges you can cast the 9th level spell Power Word Kill, which allows you to instantly kill any target as long as it has less than 100 hit points, without a saving throw. And then the main ability of the item, Call Undead where you can call forth a number of skeletons or zombies just as long as their hit points evenly divide to be under 500. So, you can call forth 22 zombies or 38 skeletons, or a combination of those two. And since the zombies and skeletons are magically created, you don't need corpses nearby to use it. And the zombies last for an entire day and obey all of your commands, with the ability resetting every day. So basically, once a day, you get a horde of zombies that you can use for whatever you want. In tier 4 levels of play, a horde of CR 1 4th creatures isn't going to be doing very much damage, as if you bring out 38 skeletons and they all attack with their shortbow attack, that's only 190 damage on average, assuming all of those attacks hit. And with only a plus 4 to their attack rolls, they're going to be missing a lot against high CR creatures. However, if we use mob combat rules and assume a creature we're fighting has an AC of 20, then, 38 skeletons, all attacking with their short bow or melee weapons, deal 45 damage guaranteed. Although an ancient red dragon has an AC of 22, which brings down the damage to 25 damage guaranteed for all 38 attacks from the skeletons, which is not a lot for having to control a horde. The zombies are even worse when it comes to damage, as they only have a plus 3 to their chance to hit and only deal 4 damage on average although zombies are much harder to kill and have a higher health pool. So there are advantages to having both of them or a mixture of the two. And of course the advantages of just having a whole bunch of creatures on the battlefield you can control, which can allow you to perform a whole bunch of special maneuvers, like having them absorb damage by getting in the way, forcing opportunity attacks, providing bodies for flanking, having them try to grapple, etc, etc. And this is just one action you can do with the item, in addition to the wand having some really nice spells to cast, or just being a really good melee weapon. And of course, the downsides of the wand. When you try to attune to the item, there is a chance it can kill you. As part of the attunement process, you have to make a DC 17 constitution saving throw, and on a success, you take 10d6 necrotic damage, which is only around 35 damage on average. Pretty much all tier 4 level players can survive the attunement damage. But if you fail the saving throw, you instead die and get risen as a zombie, which makes it very hard to bring you back to life. However, if you manage to survive the attunement process, then there isn't really too many other downsides besides the detrimental properties of the artifact item, as it does have a grand total of three of them, in addition to a major detrimental property, which can be kind of bad for most characters if you roll really badly on that chart. Now, the wand also has some extra benefits if you're the lore character, Orcus, controlling the wand himself, or if Orcus himself blesses the person who has the wand. But chances are that's not going to come up, so I'm just going to ignore those for this video, and only talk about what you gain if you don't involve Orcus at all. And what you get is a lot of really good benefits, with only the small downside that it might kill you when you try to attune to it, which is kind of worth it for what you get out of it. And at number 3, we have the Sword of Zariel from Descent into Avernus. When you attune to this item, it basically turns you into an angel and gives you a whole bunch of really good benefits, like setting your charisma score to 20, gaining advantage on insight checks to detect lies, the thing people use insight checks for the most, permanent true sight, resistance to necrotic and radiant damage, extra benefits versus fiends, and 90 feet of flying speed, which is huge for players to have 
That's literally triple the baseline movement speed, which allows for all kinds of battleground shenanigans, where you can fly in and hit and then just fly around a corner so you can't be targeted by anything. In addition, the sword itself does extra damage when used as a one-handed weapon, where it deals an additional 2d8 radiant damage, which is higher damage than a great sword, and if you're wielding it two-handed, it deals an additional 3d10 radiant damage instead, which is equivalent to hitting three times with a longsword. So if you wield the sword with two hands, it hits four times harder than a normal longsword. The sword also only has two minor beneficial properties, so no real downsides to the detrimental properties on this weapon, other than the fact that it does change your personality too. When you attune to the sword, the sword only lets you attune to it if it deems you a worthy person, and then will override your personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. So from an RP standpoint, this can completely change your character into basically a much more good version of himself. But since the sword only really allows good aligned people to attune to it anyway, it's not really that much of a detriment. Basically, its only downside can be completely ignored if all you care about is the numbers. If all you want is a really good sword and don't care about your character becoming an angel of goodness, the Sword of Zariel is pretty great. Definitely one of the better artifact items, really easy to use, with a whole bunch of good benefits, and can almost deal more damage than a Moonblade. Although I can't really stress enough just how good having 90 feet of fly speed is. And permanent true sight. Definitely a 9 out of 10 artifact item. The top two spots only beat it out by virtue of just being a tiny bit more broken. And at number two, we have the Worm Skull Throne from Storm King's Thunder. Now, this throne can only be used if you control another item called the Ruling Scepter. But for this item, we're going to assume you have both the throne and one of the scepters. Because the only thing the scepter does is allow you to use the throne, basically. Now, while you have control of the throne correctly, because if you don't have the scepter, the throne will just lock you inside of it, you gain a number of pretty powerful benefits, like most artifact items. The throne allows you to fly 30 feet a turn, and allows you to go through walls and earth. It has 9 charges and allows you to spend those charges in order to do one of three things. You can spend one charge to cast the lightning bolt spell at 9th level, which deals 14d6 lightning damage to everything in a 20 foot line, which is not half bad for a feature that you can do 9 times a day. It also allows you to spend two charges to cast the Globe of Invulnerability from the throne, which affects both the creature and the throne itself, which basically makes you immune to 5th level and lower spells for one minute, while still being able to use your own spells from inside the throne to attack other things. And finally, the main function of the throne, you can spend three charges in order to create a spectral ancient blue dragon that surrounds the throne, which at the end of your turn will attack with the ancient blue dragon's multi-attack basically where it will use one bite and two claw attacks against targets of your choice, which have the exact same stats and damage of an ancient blue dragon's bite and claw attacks. And this spectral image lasts for one minute. So basically, for an entire minute, you gain an extra round of ancient blue dragon attacks at the end of your turn, which is just an insane damage boost that can be basically free on all of your subsequent turns. There isn't really a buff that allows you to deal an extra 63 damage on average every turn while also being able to do your other full actions. And the downside to the throne aren't really that bad, just as long as you have the scepter, as it only really has flavorful things where you hear faint whispers, but there's no mechanical negative side effects to those whispers. So, you just get an awesome throne that can move through walls, fires 9th level lightning bolts as his basic attack, can become immune to most spells for a minute, and deal the damage of an ancient blue dragon at the end of each of your turns. When it comes to pure combat potential, the Worm Skull Throne is one of the best with the Spectral Dragon image ability, probably second only to the number 4 Tooth in the Teeth of Delvinar, which allows you to deal an additional 3d10 damage with your first attack. The number one item on this list doesn't beat the throne when it comes to damage potential, but it does beat it in different ways. And at number one, we have the Eye in Hand of Vecna. Now technically, this is two separate items, but they have a set bonus that activates when you use both of them together, where if you're attuned to both the hand and eye, you gain the benefits where you're immune to diseases and poisons, your x-ray vision doesn't have negative side effects, you can't be surprised, you gain 1d10 hit points every turn, you gain a spam touch spell that allows you to instantly kill creatures if they fail a DC 18 constitution saving throw, and the biggest bonus is once every 30 days, you can use an action to cast the Wish spell. Now, normally when you get an item to cast the Wish spell, you can circumvent the downsides of Wish by just using it on a character who can't use Wish anyway. But with the eye in hand not really allowing you to pass them around, you do actually have to stick to the rules of the Wish spell with this item. 
But even then, getting a free wish every 30 days is great if you're on a fighter that normally can't use it anyway. Or if you're a spellcaster who can, this would give you two wish spells in one day, which could help you win an important encounter. And even the legendary items that do allow you to cast the wish spell, like the Luck Blade or the Ring of Three Wishes, only allow you to use them a limited number of times, and then you can never use them again. Whereas the Eye and Hand of Vecna allows you to do them once every month. Still a pretty sizable cooldown on the ability, but you could potentially use more wish spells than those legendary items. And remember, with the wish spell, you could do basically anything your DM allows you to get away with. You could summon an endless army of giants to destroy the world, for example. Or you could give yourself and nine of the party members permanent resistance to fire damage. If you do something creative with it, though, you have a chance of a monkey paw scenario popping up, where the DM can twist the wish or just doesn't allow it to happen. Plus, there's a 33% chance you won't be able to use Wish again. As it turns out, casting spells through items counts as you casting the spell, so you still suffer the negative side effects of those spells. So if you want to avoid that, you can still make great use out of it if you just use it to instantly cast an 8th level or lower spell with no cost. Some standout examples being obviously the 7th level spell Simulacrum, to duplicate a friendly spellcaster or yourself for a great combat partner, or a great ally that lasts until it's destroyed normally requiring a 12-hour cast time and 1,500 gold. Instant and free if you use Wish. You could use the 7th level spell Resurrection to bring a dead party member back to life to full health, but with negative 4 to all of its rolls. Or bring someone back who died up to 100 years ago. Normally, a 1-hour cast time and 1,000 gold, free to cast with Wish. Even some lower level spells like Hollow or Awaken. Hollow has a 24-hour cast time and a 1,000 gold cost, but allows you to enchant a 60-foot area to do all kinds of beneficial effects. Like one of them is to make all enemies vulnerable to a type of magic damage. Awakened can be used on a nearby animal or plant to create a 30-day pet that can scout or help out in combat. And so on and so on. There's lots of useful applications of Wish, even if you only use it in its safe way. Now, outside of the benefits you gain from combining both of them, the hand and eye themselves do also have their own individual effects where the hand will make your strength score become 20, and it will also add an additional 2d8 cold damage with your melee attacks, and it has charges that allow you to cast a number of spells, with standout ones being Teleport or Finger of Death. And the eye grants you True Sight. It allows you to use your action to gain X-ray vision, and has charges to cast its own number of spells, with standout ones being the 8th level spell Dominate Monster or Disintegrate, a useful hard-hitting single-target damage spell. So the hand and eye are full of almost nothing but really good effects. They allow you to cast some really useful spells with their charges, and it allows you to spam an ability which can instantly kill someone, and it gives you passive regeneration, and of course the free wish spell once every month. But the downsides of the artifact combinations are kind of bad. When you cast a spell from the eye, there's a 5% chance your character will just die and have their soul absorbed by Vecna, and their body will be controlled like a puppet. Also, if you use charges from the hand, you have a suggestion spell cast on yourself, where if you fail a DC 18 saving throw for it, it will command you to commit an evil act. At least the hand is a lot more manageable, and won't instantly kill your character like the eye will. You also have to tear out one of your eyes and cut off your left hand in order to attune to the eye in hand, but you get a neat eye in hand replacement, so that's not big of a deal. Unless that is a deal breaker to your character for an RP reason. Oh, and your alignment is changed to neutral evil when you attune to either the eye or hand. But honestly, as long as you just never use the spells associated to these two items, you don't really have to worry about the downsides. And you can still cast the wish spell once every 30 days, and spam your instant kill ability by touching things. Assuming you successfully land the touch attack, and they fail the saving throw. The spells are really nice though, so I can totally see trying to risk it. But you don't have to, and it's still useful. And because of just how ridiculously useful the Wish Spell is, the Iron Hand of Vecna kind of has to take number one spot on this list. It's definitely another 9 out of 10 artifact item. Would probably be a 10 out of 10 if it didn't have such bad downsides. Adventuring Gear is the lowest rarity item in the game. Think non-magic items. So in this list, we're going to go over the best types of Adventuring Gear. And at number 10, we have Flower. While technically a trade good and not an adventuring good, we're not going to make a trade goods video, so it's best to include it here. I'm sure we all know what flour is, used for baking and cooking, except other than that, it has some other uses. 
First off, flour is a great use for many types of foods, fried goods, cakes, and breads, but it also has some good uses in dungeons. The first use is to disperse it into the air to look for air currents. Stuck in a dungeon looking for an exit? Well, following the wind, no matter how faint it is, it's actually a good way to find the surface. Or at least tell your DM that's what you're doing and they might throw you a bone and tell you if you're close. Another use is to look for wire traps. While wires are hard to see, they are made slightly easier when coated in flour. And speaking of these things, the final and actual most useful use of flour is to cover invisible enemies in the stuff. Enemy just went invisible? Well then throw a handful of flour onto them and that invisibility is wasted. While other powders could be used as well for more adventurer base uses, flour is by far the easiest to obtain. Another fun thing, flour can be highly flammable in specific situations. So if you create a situation with a tight and close space with dry enough temperatures filled with flour dust particles, it can cause an explosion. Although don't expect to be able to do something like that in any old cave or dungeon room, unless your DM is okay with wonky physics and kind of allows you to hand wave a lot of stuff. And at number nine, we have cold weather gear. These three items would be much higher in the list if not for the fact they're only really useful in campaigns that specifically take place in cold areas, like the Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. First, we have the crampons. These chain spikes are attached to the underside of boots and give players traction on ice, making them immune to the chance to slip on ice and fall prone, without any other penalties to your speed. Something that comes up quite often in icy campaign settings. Next is the snowshoes, large bands of animal hide and twisted wood, these are stuck to the bottom of your boots and prevent you from falling through the snow. And lastly, cold weather clothing. Of course, when you are in Arctic conditions, you're going to be worried about the cold weather. Exhaustion, slowness, and even death. All of the side effects of cold. However, as long as you wear this clothing and keep it dry, you're basically immune to these effects. And at number 8, we have the Explosive Trio. While limited, depending on your campaign setting and how lenient your GM is, uh, there are these things called the gunpowder, blasting powder, and dynamite. Now, all of these things are items in the normal player's handbook. But, under the optional rules segments, if you're playing a more modern campaign setting and need official rules on how these items might work. So you can't just use them in any old random game and specifically need DM approval if they will even be in their setting or world. With that out of the way, first up we have gunpowder, used for pistols and rifles. They can be used to light up areas for a single round, 30 feet of bright light, or 30 feet of dim light for a single round once you light up an ounce of it. However, you can also detonate large amounts. Once lit, the gunpowder will explode with the DC-12 deck save, taking half damage on a success. It hits everyone within 10 feet of the gunpowder, 3d6 if the powdered horn, or 76 if it's an entire keg. Next, we have blasting powder. When ignited by a flame or fuse, the pouch explodes. Each creature within 5 feet must make a DC-13 deck save, taking 3d6 bludgeoning damage on a failed save or half as much on a success. However, you can bind multiple torches together at a time, each extra pouch increasing the damage by a 1d6, capping out at 10d6, and a blast radius by 5 feet, max of 20 feet. So, if you bind 4 pouches together, you get a 20 foot range and a total of 66 damage. But after that, the next 4 pouches you add only increase the damage and not the explosion radius. Lastly, we have dynamite. These come in sticks and can be thrown up to 60 feet at a target location. Each creature within 5 feet must make a DC 12 deck save or take 3d6 damage on a failure or half on a success, just like blasting powder. Also, like blasting powder, you can put multiple of them together, again increasing their damage by 1d6 for each additional stick, up to 10d6, and a blast radius by 5 feet up to 20 feet. Dynamite can also be rid with a longer fuse to explode after a specific amount of rounds. These explosive items are very good, that is if you can get your hands on them, but the dynamite can be used in combat to do large amounts of damage to enemies as a thrown explosive. And all three of these items can be used to blow up structures, like castle walls or as a trap. However, they are not usually something that you can set up in an instant. These explosives are excellent amounts of damage from non-magic items, which is why they make the list, but not at a high spot since they are technically optional rules and about as rules as written as the flanking rules. I.e., these items are official, but as an optional rule you can add to the game, and not one you should expect your DM to be available to if you randomly walk into a city and ask for some blasting powder. Next at number 7 we have a few throwable liquids. These liquids have the special effects of being either splashed on a nearby enemy or thrown at a distance, using the rules for an improvised weapon attack. 
First, we have Alchemist Fire. On hit, deals 1d4 fire damage to the target, and at the start of each of its turn, forever. That is, until the enemy spends their action performing a DC 10 dexterity check to extinguish the flames. While it is rather tame, only dealing 1d4 damage a turn, this can add up quick, especially as trying to put it out costs you an action. Using this on a single boss monster like a giant, this would be a great way to expend your single action to use the giant's much more powerful action, or simply have a constant dot applied to the enemy dealing 1d4 damage every turn. Next is Acid. This liquid is pretty simple. It deals 2d6 acid damage to the target upon being hit, and while that is all, Acid on command can be quite useful. Melting things, burning things, whatever needs you might have. And fun fact, unlike the Acid Splash Cantrip, you can actually use this on objects, not just a target creature. And lastly, we have Oil. Upon hitting an enemy with it, the target is coated with oil for up to a minute. This does nothing on its own, although some DMs may play into the flavor of this and give the enemy a chance to slip or drop something. But its real effect is that once the enemy takes fire damage before the oil dries up, they will take an extra 5 fire damage. Although oil does have another effect we will mention later on in the video. These items are amazing to have as support items. Let's say you're fighting an enemy who's vulnerable to fire, but resistant to non-magical physical damage. Give some oil to your fighter, and while they can't do much to help, they could apply this oil to the enemy, adding 5 extra damage to your wizard's next firebolt. And at number 6, we have the portable ram. This is a simple item, the object simply wielding it gives you a plus 5 to any strength checks used to break down doors. Although this could really be used for anything, breaking down gates, walls, furniture, etc, etc. However, you also get advantage on that check, if an ally assists you by working with the portable ram. With a plus 5 and advantage to your strength checks, putting this on your usual fighter or barbarian, who needs thieves tools when you can just demolish the door in an instant? You also don't need any special tool proficiencies to use the ram to its full potential, unlike thieves tools. Next, at number 5, we have the 10 foot pole. While I would not touch a yeti with this pole, you could touch other things with it. For example, a heavily trapped dungeon. Wire trap? Use the pole to trigger it from a safe distance. Pressure plate trap? Smack it from a distance with the pole. Crushing trap? Depending on how strong the pole is, or how strong the walls or ceilings are, the pole may not be able to stop the thing from crushing your party, but at least give you a few extra seconds to get out. Sheer wall or cliff to climb? Use the pole to help get yourself a 10 foot start. While carrying this around may be somewhat difficult, it has so many different uses it's well worth it. Although, it heavily relies on your imagination and a willing DM. But just going by rules as written, it's super useful for just poking around for traps. It's probably the easiest and cheapest way to avoid a lot of common dungeon traps. And at number 4, we have trap items. Now, what does this mean? Well, these are items that can be set up either mid-combat or before combat and allow you to control the battlefield, without having to use expensive high-level spell slots. These items are amazing for ambushes or defending an area. Need to hold off against an attacking force trying to intrude on your village's town hall? Well, set these up and go full home alone against them. First off, oil. As we mentioned earlier, we would come back to this. While you can douse an enemy in oil by throwing oil onto them, or at them, you can also just pour it onto the floor, covering a 5 foot square with the oil, as long as the area is level. Then, if lit, it burns for 2 rounds, dealing 5 damage to any creature that enters the area during their turn, or ends their turn in the area, although only able to take the damage once a turn. With enough oil, you could coat an entire area in oil, and just wait for your enemy to enter the area and then light it aflame. That, or as enemies approach narrow doorways coated with oil aflame. And now, if they want to enter the room, they have to take 5 guaranteed fire damage. And while the oil, once lit, only burns for 2 rounds, that is easily enough time to demolish an attacking force, especially when paired with the other trap items. Next, we have the hunting trap. This steel saw tooth ring shuts when an enemy steps into its pressure pad at the bottom. This trap is attached to a chain and then to something else, wrapped around maybe a tree or onto a piton snapped into the ground. If an enemy steps onto the plate, they must succeed a DC 13 deck save or take 1d4 piercing damage and instantly stop moving. Thereafter, the creature can only move as far as the chain connected to the trap will let them. That is, unless they break free. Use it in action to perform a DC 13 strength check. Although, if your wizard steps into one of these, luckily a friend can help you, and hopefully they will, because if you try to break free and fail, you take one point of piercing damage. So if you're a low strength class and ever get trapped in one of these, 
don't try to break free yourself. Get your fellow martial classes to help you out. And quick thing, yes, this item, while amazing for setting traps, is also very useful for hunting because, well, of course, you can hide under leaves or use it on animals to get some fresh rations. Especially since compared to other traps, this one is much more obvious. And unless you hide it one way or another, or leave it in a dark place, or just hit it around a corner, it's unlikely an intelligent enemy will stumble into one of these. Next, we have Caltrops. As an action, you can spread a bag of these to cover a 5-foot area. Any creature that enters the area must make a DC 15 dex check, or stop moving and take 1 piercing damage. And while the effect itself is strong, it also has the insanely powerful effect of, until the victim heals at least 1 hit point, their walking speed is reduced by 10 feet. This is like having a permanent ray of frost effect on an enemy, as not many enemies, especially at low CR, are able to heal themselves. Although enemies who notice the Caltrops can choose to move at half speed to travel through the area, automatically succeeding the saving throw. And lastly, Ball Barons. As an action, you can spill these tiny metal balls to cover a 10 by 10 foot square. Any creature moving through the area must succeed a DC 10 deck saving throw or fall prone. Like the Caltrops, moving at half speed means they not need to make a saving throw. While each of these items are rather tame, knowing where and when to use them can be quite devastating to enemies, especially when run together. Ball bearings and burning oil, running through the oil takes an extra 5 damage and a deck save, if they fail and fall prone. Then, they have to spend half their movement getting up, and if they don't have enough movement to do that, then also get up, they will take another bit of extra fire damage. Or do the same with caltrops instead of ball bearings, making them stop in place in the middle of the fire, and also reduce their speed. So, next time you're playing an ambush or need to defend yourself from an invading force of bandits, make sure to pick up a couple of bags of ball bearings and caltrops a couple flasks of oil, and a couple hunting traps. Now to the final three. We have the spell items. These include the spell book, which is required by all wizards. This is where they write down their spells. And while I would love to go over the entire process, that is an entire video on its own. Put simply, wizards need a spell book if they want to get access to lots of spells. Next we have the component pouch. This pouch basically acts as an item that lets you ignore the component cost of any spell you cast. Meaning, no more having to write a massive list of every single spell component you have, and getting mad when you forget to pick a random spell component you need for one single spell you cast the entire campaign. Or, it allows you to act like how most people use spells and just kind of ignore those things anyway. This is the official way to ignore those component costs. However, this does not work for spell components that have specific gold costs. So, you still need to buy and carry spell components that have a high specific cost. Like, for example, Resurrection, which specifically requires a 1,000 gold diamond. Lastly, the Spell Focus. Classes that cast spells require a Spell Focus to do so. Specifically, these are the Spell Foci. The Artificer needs a set of Artisan tools to act as their Spell Focus. The Cleric and Paladin need a Holy Symbol, an item which represents their god or pantheon. Maybe an amulet, a symbol carved, or emblem on a shield. A tiny box holding a relic. They need to hold on to it, wear it, or bear it to use it. The Druidic Focus can be used with a wand, staff, or scepter made of special wood, a sprig of mistletoe or holly, or a totem incorporating feathers, bones, fur, and teeth from a sacred animal, allowing, well, obviously a druid to cast spells through it. Bards use a musical instrument as their spell focus, and lastly the Arcane Focus, used by sorcerers, warlocks, wizards, these are orbs, crystals, rods, staves, or wands, or really any item if your DM allows it, as long as it's designed to channel the power of the arcane. These three types of items are very important. Without a focus, most classes can't cast spells. Without a component pouch, casters need to lug around a few hundred different spell components and constantly worry about micromanaging. And without a spellbook, wizards are just bad. In fact, you can completely neuter a wizard if you just destroy their spellbook. And at number two, we have the kits. Kits are a series of items that are just full of a whole bunch of really useful stuff. These include the Climber's Kit, which includes boot tips, gloves, special pittens, a harness, and allowing you to anchor yourself to help you climbing by preventing you from falling. Amazingly useful for if you have a dangerous cliff climb ahead of you. Fishing Tackle, which includes a wooden rod, silken line, corkwood bobbers, steel hooks, lead sinkers, velvet lures, and a narrow netting. While not often used in a survival campaign, you need this to fish for food. The mess kit, which is a tin box with a cup, some culture, and half the box can be used as a cooking pan, while the other a shallow bowl. 
This kit is, well, not great. It is somewhat useful for being a little bundle for cooking and eating, but that's really it. The Poisoner's Kit contains some vials, chemicals, and generic equipment needed to make poisons, allowing you to add your proficiency bonus to ability checks to craft or use poisons. Although you do need proficiency with this kit in order to use its effect. The Forgery Kit, it also requires proficiency to use it. It comes with papers, parchment, pens, inks, seals, sealing wax, gold and silver leaf, and other supplies needed to make document forgeries. And of course, using this kit lets you add your proficiency bonus to any ability check you make to forge a document. But of these kits, there are three that are a little bit more important than the rest. Specifically, the Healer's Kit. This kit has 10 uses. It comes with a whole bunch of different stuff related to healing, and by consuming one of its charges, you can use the kit as an action to stabilize a downed creature without needing to make a medicine check. Amazing for groups who make sure they don't need to rely on good rolls, or where they risk the member who's currently down being the only one with a good medicine skill. The Herbalism Kit comes with clippers, motor, pestle, pouches, and vials, and proficiency with this kit allows you to add your proficiency bonus to any ability check to use to identify or apply herbs, as well as allowing you to create antitoxins and potions of healing. And the Disguise Kits, which has hair dyes, small props. Proficiency with this kit lets you add your proficiency modifier to any ability checks you make to create visual disguises, because not all of us are spellcasters able to use Disguise Self. Especially since enemies who can see through magical disguises cannot see through physical disguises. Kits are wonderful items to pick up, as most of them don't require proficiency to use, and contain a fair few amount of useful item, like vials. That is, if your DM lets you use them for purposes outside of the item normal use. And lastly, at number one, we have tools. Originally, most tools have no specific use outside of only what's listed in their name. Leatherworking is used for leatherworking, cooked utensils is used for cooking, and so on and so on. However, with Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we got a massive list of special bonuses and effects all tools could provide if you're proficient in those tools. And while I would like to go over every single one of these, we will simply go over some of the biggest effects these provide, or else this video would be an hour long. But these effects range from giving the player extra information or advantage on very specific skill checks based on what they know. Brewer's supplies can purify up to six gallons of water during a long rest, or one gallon during a short rest. A man died in a tavern? Well, a brewer, chef, or alchemist gets advantage to know if food or drink he had poisoned him. Cobbler's tools can maintain up to six creatures' shoes during a long rest, giving them a buff for the next 24 hours, which allows them to travel up to 10 hours a day without needing to make saving throws to avoid exhaustion, allowing usually an extra two hours of travel. Or, if you spend eight hours working, you can add a hidden compartment to a pair of shoes to hold objects up to three inches long and one inch wide and deep, or even find similar components in other pairs of shoes. A gaming set allows you to alter dice rolls, swap pieces, or palm cards with a sleight of hand check, or even manipulate a game's components to pickpocket. And the Thieves Tools lets you disable and create traps in addition to opening locked doors, probably some of the most useful tools you can have. And there are many, many more special abilities you can get with these tools. These extra effects are added with Xanathar's Guide to Everything as a way to give tool proficiencies more value. So you do need a specific proficiency to use any of these effects, but some of them are quite powerful. In this video, we'll be going over the cheapest items you can buy in Dungeons & Dragons. This list is restricted to items that are valued at one silver piece and below, but is not arranged in order of price, but rather in order of utility. So the number two spot on this list is more expensive than the number three spot, but is also more useful. Starting us off at number 10, we have the ink pen. This is basically just a specially card stick and sells for two copper pieces. The issues with this item is that alone, it does nothing special for you. This isn't a modern ballpoint pen, but rather it's more like a fountain pen just made of wood, where you have to dip it into a vial of ink before you can use it to draw or write something down. And one ounce of ink costs 10 gold pieces. So to use this item, it's much more expensive than any other spot on this list. Still, this is an item that can actually see use in a game, specifically for wizards, as they have the ability to copy down spells into their spell book, and to do that, they need something to actually write with. While typically, as long as the player spends the gold in the required special inks for copying the spells, the DM won't ask if your character actually has something to write with. So even if you do need one of these, your DM may forget to ask if you actually have one. This item is more useful than some of the other items on this list, but because it requires ink to be useful, it only takes the bottom spot, as without that, it's useless. 
And at number nine, we have rigid vessels for containing liquid, specifically the jug, pitcher, tankard, and flask. These were all grouped together because they all serve the same purpose, just at slightly different sizes, and they all cost two copper pieces. I doubt I have to explain to you what these do, but as a scriptwriter, I get paid by the word, and I will increase the length of this video slightly by drawing this out. Just keep quiet about this so he doesn't realize while he's reading. Hey, wait a minute. We should probably cut that out. Getting back on track, there are ways to use all these items in combat if your DM is willing to work with you a little bit. They can be used to carry liquids during travel, jugs and pitchers hold one gallon while the tankard and the flask hold one pint. Maybe the party needs to collect blood to complete some sort of ritual, you wouldn't want to put that into your water skin. You could use them to create some sort of makeshift trap by putting them above a door to spill on a creature when it walks through. Be that water for a prank or oil, which we'll talk a little bit more later on, so that you can set them on fire with a firebolt spell. You can also keep a vessel full of some sort of powder, be it dirt, flour, or ground up chalk that you could throw into the direction of a visible creature, allowing the party to potentially see their footprints to sort of know where the invisible creature is. However, despite this, there is no mechanical benefits to doing so, due to the way invisibility works. As while a creature is invisible, it can take the hide action anywhere due to be considered heavily obscured. However, until they do, other creatures can still hit them just with disadvantage. The powder could help you track them if they happen to escape, so maybe you could get some sort of use out of this. All of these things can also be done with a bucket. However, a bucket costs five copper pieces and is much harder to create a lid for a bucket and is way more expensive than the jug, pitcher, tankard, and flask, which took the spot instead. Anyway, the place you will most often find jugs and pitchers is in taverns as they will be used to serve large quantities of alcohol to adventurers after a long day of adventuring, while tankards and flasks are what these same adventurers will drink that alcohol from. These are incredibly integral to the aesthetic of almost any D&D game. And because of that, and their marginal usage, and their low price, they made it onto this list. So the next time you go into a tavern and you want a souvenir, maybe ask the tavern keep if you can buy a tanker to commemorate the night. That is, if you can remember the wild night you had when you wake up the next morning. And number eight, we have the signal whistle. This item cost five copper pieces, and as I'm sure you could have guessed, this is a small whistle used for signaling. Now, you may have never thought to use this, but there are times when you do need to signal things, even in a D&D game, like coordinating an ambush, troop movements on a battlefield, or maybe even waking up your party members when you're ambushed during the night. That said, there are spells that do the same thing, like the third level spell sending or the first level spell alarm, so you don't really ever see this item used. At least I have never seen it used, and that's why it takes a lower spot on this list. It has more potential to be actually useful during adventures than the previous spots on this list, although it is still rarely used. And at number 7, we have a flask of oil. This is the only item on this list that cost one silver piece, and what this item allows you to do is splash it on a creature within 5 feet of you, or make a ranged improvised weapon attack with it at a 20 foot range, shattering on impact. If the attack hits the target, they become covered in oil. The oil will dry after one minute, but if the target is hit by fire damage before then, they take five additional fire damage as the oil burns them. You can also pour the oil on the ground coated in an area of five feet or just one square. When it lits, it burns for two rounds and deals five damage to any creature that enters or ends its turn in the area. However, the creature can only take this damage once per turn. As we talked about in the number nine spot, this is an excellent item to use for a trap, either by dropping it on someone when they come through a door, or by coating the ground in front of the door right before you know an enemy's about to go through. Given how cheap this item is, it's a pretty useful item especially for tier 1 levels of play, where 5 damage is a reasonable amount. Still, for a 1 use item, this could be a bit expensive, and as it is a flat 5 damage, it really falls off the higher level you, and by extension the monsters you are fighting, get. And for that reason, while it does make this list, it's just at a lower spot. And at number 6, we have a simple sack. This is another item that I really shouldn't need to explain, as it's just a bag that holds stuff. A sack only costs one copper piece, and you might be wondering, why would this be useful to me? Well, backpacks can only hold so much stuff, and most of its space will be taken up by your clothes and other adventuring gear. Even portable holes, bags of holding, and Heward's handy haversacks have limits to their carrying capacity. Even demiplanes have a limit to their space. The point being, a good sack allows you to carry more treasure on your person, for when, say, your players raid Tiamat's lair, which mine did, and despite having four bags of holding, one portable hole, and two demi-planes, they could only retrieve a fraction of her hoard. In a later game I had, some NPCs who were stuck in a time loop were trying to raid one of those demi-planes as an easter egg, but you could probably make that an entire campaign. Getting back on track, a sack is just a useful item for adventurers to have, as even in low or no magic settings, a trusty sack will increase the amount of treasure a party adventures can bring back with them, 
when they leave the dungeon that they were exploring. And at number 5, we have Sling Bullets. Like with all ranged weapons, the sling requires ammunition, and while arrows and crossbow bolts only cost 1 gold piece for 20, you can get 20 sling bullets for only 4 copper pieces. In the real world, the sling, when used as a weapon of war, was actually pretty deadly. However, in Dungeons and Dragons, it only deals 1d4 bludgeoning damage, so it's not used very often. Still, if you're tight on cash, this could be a great option, as the sling itself only costs 1 silver piece, while 20 bullets cost 4 copper. A dart costs 5 copper pieces, so the price of 3 darts you can get a sling and 20 shots, which is a lot more useful. Not to mention longer range, as the close range for a sling is 30 feet, with a long range of 120 feet, while the short range of a dart is 30 feet, with only a long range of 60 feet. The same as the hand crossbow, just 75 gold cheaper. Sling bullets aren't the best ammunition, but they certainly are the cheapest, and so it makes this list. And at number 4, we have piton. A single piton costs 5 copper pieces. And while you would probably need more than one to effectively scale a wall, the Dungeoneer's Pack, which on many classes you get as a starter equipment, comes with 10 of them. For those of you who don't know, a piton is a steel pike with an eye that you can loop rope through, and can be used to climb up walls that don't have good handholds. Think of it as a giant needle specialized for climbing. You wedge them into cracks and rocks faces so that if you fall, the rope can catch you instead of plummeting when you slip. When it comes to adventuring, you never really know what you might face, so it's always good to be prepared. And a few of these are an excellent thing to keep in the bottom of your pack, just in case you happen upon a section of your adventure where you must climb up a cliff or something, which, depending on your campaign, could be pretty common or never come up once. Still, these are pretty useful, so they take a higher spot on this list. And starting off on our top three, we have one piece of chalk, which cost one copper piece. While you can't use it to write in your spellbook, chalk can be still very helpful to an adventurer especially when you're going through a maze, or really any dungeon crawl. A single chalk mark on the wall with directional arrows so that you might know where you have already been, and the way out if you end up running into a creature that you can't beat. This is one thing that cannot be replaced by magic. However, this is also something that probably wouldn't actually come up in a game, because usually the players know their way out, and by extension the characters do as well. So this is with so many other items falls into the category of technically useful but practically never used. However, if your DM allows it, you might be able to grind it up into a powder and throw it into the eyes of your opponents, or throw the dust on the ground to see the footprints of invisible creatures, or you could use the chalk on your hands to improve your grip on something like a rope or for climbing the face of a mountain. Still, it is cheap, and it has uses that range from dungeon delving to children's games, so it takes a higher spot on this list. And at number 2, we have the 10-foot pole. This is a classic item after all. Sometimes you do need to touch things, and why touch it with your ungloved bare hand, when you could touch it with a 10-foot pole instead. Going through a room or hallway where you expect traps, keep your 10-foot pole in front of you to trigger those traps before they trigger on you. Things like pressure plates can be triggered potentially before you walk into their killing zone, and pit traps can be revealed before you step into them. If you want to learn about some other types of traps, you can check out my video on the top 10 dungeon traps, some of which can be dealt with with a 10-foot pole, others not so much. A 10-foot pole is an excellent item that any adventurer could carry around. If you can figure out how to make a collapsible one, that would be even better. But I highly recommend you keep one of these on hand at all times. And last but not least, at number one, we have the torch and candle. These both cost one copper pieces and fulfill the exact same function of providing light. Now, before you all chime down in the comments letting us know that you have dark vision, there are a few things to point out here. Because even in a party where everyone has dark vision, it's a good idea to have a torch lit. You see, dark vision lets a creature see in dim light as if it were bright light, and in darkness as if it were dim light. But dim light makes everything lightly obscured, which gives you disadvantage on perception checks that rely on sight. And the last thing you want when checking for traps is disadvantage in the roll, although this is another point in favor of having a 10 foot pole. So with 60 feet of dark vision and no torch lit, you can only see 60 feet and everything is lightly obscured. A torch provides 20 feet of bright light and then 20 feet additional dim light, giving someone with dark vision 40 feet of normal or bright light vision, and then 60 more feet of vision into the darkness as if it was dim light, pushing your vision out to a total of 100 feet, up from just 60. Long story short, even with dark vision, unless you need to remain hidden, just lighting up a torch will make a world of difference. Another thing with dark vision is that with it, you are basically using a sort of night vision where you can't see any color. So your DM could throw in a trap that involves color in some way, where unless you see color, you will end up triggering it like a sign that says press the green tile to deactivate the dragon's breath. And then there's a bunch of tiles, but unless they have some light, they cannot tell which one is green. If they don't press the right one, then it activates a trap spewing fire into the room. The candle does the same thing as a torch, but on a much smaller scale. 
as it provides only 5 feet of bright light, and then 5 feet of dim light beyond that. But if your characters are worried about getting spotted in the dark, yet still need a source of light, the candle is a great option to get light, but just much less of it, while still being super cheap, again, only at a single copper piece. These are both excellent adventuring items that are simultaneously cheap, useful, and actually see play in games. In fact, unless you are in a game where you never go inside, there is probably a torch used in every D&D game. If not by the players, then at least by the NPCs in their taverns, temples, or secret lairs. In this video, we'll be going over the most powerful items that existed in official source books for D&D, with no real limit on which items can appear on the list, just as long as they're obtainable from one of the books that's been put out by Wizards of the Coast for 5th edition. And at number 10, we have the Talisman of Pure Good. This is a legendary item which requires attunement by a good creature, and has the ability to instantly kill an evil-aligned creature on a pretty high deck save, where the target must succeed a DC-20 dexterity saving throw or else instantly die and be destroyed, leaving no remains, as a fissure opens up and eats them up. Although, if they are a flying creature, this has no effect on them. Now, being able to instantly kill a creature is pretty good, especially since the DC check is actually pretty high, so there's a good chance you'll actually succeed on this. And since most bad guys you'll be using this against will probably be evil aligned, you have a wide range of options to use it on. Although, the talisman only has 7 charges, and if you use all of them then the talisman destroys itself. So really, you only get 6 tries before it goes away, but that's still very generous. In addition, it has two other effects. One of them allows it to deal damage if it touches a non-good creature, where a neutral creature will take 66 radiant damage, and an evil creature takes 8d6. And if you are a cleric or paladin, the talisman can be used as a holy symbol, and gives them an additional plus 2 to their spell attack rolls, essentially acting as a plus 2 wand of the war mage. So, these two extra effects are alright. It's really the ability to instantly kill something that makes it on this list, there's also one for evil creatures called the Talisman of Ultimate Evil, which basically has the same effects except reversed, where it allows you to instantly kill good creatures. And at number 9, we have the Cloak of Invisibility. This is a legendary item from Water Deep Dragon Heist, which has the effect to turn you invisible for up to 2 hours. The invisibility granted by this cloak does not break on damage or by doing damage, so it will give you advantage on all of your attacks if you're performing attack rolls, in addition to all the other super useful features of being invisible, like sneaking around places and stealing things. Really, what's so good about this cloak is the fact that you can kind of use up its 2 hour duration however you want in whichever amount of chunks you want. Because you see, it doesn't just last for 2 hours when you use it. You get 2 hours of use per day. And you can choose to use up the cloak in increments of 1 minute by using an action to pull up or down its hood. So you could just use this right before a battle and only use up one minute of it per fight, which essentially means you have invisibility for every single fight you participate in without having to use a spell. And if you're able to do it before combat begins without using an action either. There's a reason this is the most sought after item in Adventures League. It's incredibly useful in all kinds of situations, including in combat, as it gives you the ever important invisibility condition. And at number eight, we have the Orb of Dragonkind. This is an artifact level item, which generally means it's going to be very strong. So in addition to the artifact benefits you get, as it gives you two minor beneficial properties, it has the ability called Dragon's Call, which states you can send out a telepathic command in all directions for 40 miles, and evil dragons in range feel compelled to come to the orb as soon as possible. But they might be hostile towards you for compelling them against their will. And you can only use this feature once per hour. Now, here's the thing with this one ability. If used in the correct location, you could essentially destroy an entire city with this item, as bringing a group of pissed off evil dragons to a city is going to cause all kinds of problems, and will definitely result in fights breaking out, even if you can't directly control the dragons and can only call them in. Although, that's not super useful for normal combat, it's more of a really good item to probably give to a villain who's up to bad things. Although, if you don't want to use its ability to call evil dragons to your location, it also allows you to cast a whole bunch of spells. Most of them are just support or healing spells, but it does allow you to cast a tech magic at will, which is pretty useful on its own as well. Although, since the usefulness of being able to call dragons to your location can vary very widely, depending on your DM and what campaign you're running, I only give this item a lower spot on this list. 
And at number 7, we have the Robe of the Arc Magi. This is currently the only item in the game which increases your spell save DC. Well, except for one Warlock item that only works on Warlocks. So it's a very sought after item by all spellcasters, as that can allow you to get your spell save DC to a point where most monsters can't possibly succeed on certain saving throws. In addition to this unique effect, it also has a nice light armor property being better than any light armor by giving you a base AC of 15 and adding all of your dexterity modifier to your armor class as well. This is better than the best medium armor even with the medium armor master feat. And if you have 20 dex, allows you to have more AC than any heavy armor as well. Although most people who can attune to this item probably won't have super high dexterity modifiers as only sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards are allowed to tune to it. So, it is a nice AC boost, but it's not going to be ridiculous unless they happen to have 20 decks. And also, it gives you magic resistance, where you just have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects, which is something that's very common on boss monsters, and part of the reason the Yuan T race is considered overpowered is because they have this ability baseline. Now, most people will pick up this robe just for the spell save DC increase, but it also gives you plus two to your spell attack bonus, which is not as rare and all four of these benefits are pretty good. The reason it makes on this list is mainly because of that spell save DC bonus though, as that's pretty strong. And at number six, we have the Horn of Valhalla. More specifically, the Iron Horn, as there are four versions of it. While the Horn does not require attunement to use, it does have certain requirements on use. You see, when you blow the horn, it will summon about 15 Berserkers if it's using the Legendary version, who will fight for you for one hour before disappearing back to Valhalla or until they drop to zero hit points. And Berserkers are CR2 monsters who have about 70 health on average, but only deal about 9 damage on average as they just have one Great Axe attack. So, they're pretty beefy creatures to summon, and if you summon enough of them in a large amount, like 15 of them at once, that's an additional 135 damage per turn, since the Berserker gives themselves advantage on their attack rolls, and they all have very high health for their low CR rating so there's a good chance they'll stay around and not die to a single AoE. In fact, they probably have more health than most players, so being able to summon 15 Berserkers is pretty good, especially on an item which doesn't require attunement. And that's where the requirements come in. You see, you can only use this horn once every 7 days, and depending on which horn you use, you need to have proficiencies in certain kinds of weapons and armor. The lowest rarity one requires no proficiencies and can be used by anyone. The Brass Horn only requires proficiency in simple weapons, which all adventurers start out with baseline. The Bronze Horn can allow you to summon up to 12 Berserkers on average, requires you to be proficient in medium armor, which is a requirement that's not super hard to achieve. And then the Legendary one, the Iron Horn, which allows you to summon up to 15 Berserkers on average, requires proficiency in all martial weapons, which is something only a handful of classes can accomplish. Although being able to summon an army of 15 Berserkers to fight for you for one hour is really good. Which is why this is definitely one of the strongest items in the game. Even if it's kind of a nightmare to keep track of all those Berserkers, I would recommend looking into mass combat rules rather than having to roll dice for 15 attacks. And at number 5, we have the Staff of the Magi. This staff has the special ability where you can break it over your knee in order to destroy it, which will create a magical explosion in a 30 foot radius that can deal 400 damage to everything within 10 feet of the center, lowering damage as you get further away from the center of the explosion. Now, 400 damage is enough to kill a vast majority of monsters in the game, with only monsters above CR20 really having the health to take a single hit from this explosion. Although you do have to destroy a legendary item in order to gain this damage for a single round, but if you just use it against the end boss of your campaign, that doesn't really matter. Although, if you're not trying to destroy the item, it does also have a whole bunch of other useful effects. The staff acts as a plus two weapon if used as a quarter staff. It also gives you plus two to your spell attack rolls. It gives you advantage on saving throws against spells, and has the ability to absorb a spell if it's targeted at you, in order to grant the staff more charges. Baseline, the staff has 50 charges, and it can use the charges to cast a whole bunch of spells which all require a different amount of charges each to use, with it being able to cast a 7th level fireball for 7 charges for example, or a lightning bolt, wall of fire, etc, etc. It also has a handful of spells it can use without charges, like detect magic, or enlarge slash reduce, in addition to a couple of cantrips and some other more situational spells, but detect magic and enlarge slash reduce are 
both good spells to have an unlimited amount of. And the explosion of the staff is determined by the amount of charges left when you break it, with the maximum amount of damage it can do being 400 if it has all 50 charges. So, with granting you a whole bunch of useful spells, great defensive options, some attack bonuses, and the ability to instantly kill some bosses, if you decide to break it, it's definitely one of the stronger items in the game. And at number 4, we have the deck of many things. This is probably one of the most banned items in games because it has potential to completely ruin everything. You see, this legendary item allows you to draw one of its 22 cards, and then has an effect based on which card you pull out. It could have an effect pretty minor, like giving you a rare item, or a 4th level fighter who fights for you, but most of the effects are pretty ridiculous with how good or bad they are. Like, one of the cards swaps your alignment from good to evil and vice versa, which can completely end certain characters who are reliant on having their alignment. One of them will teleport you to a different dimension with none of your items, and you can't be located by any magic except a wish. And if your party doesn't have access to the wish spell, then that's basically the end of your character. Some of them provide permanent negative debuffs, like giving you a negative penalty to all saving throws, or permanently reducing your intelligence by 1d4 plus 1. Some of them increase your ability scores, others will give you tons of gold, and a lot of them will increase or decrease your experience. So it's possible to gain or lose levels with some of the draws, and make a level disparity between you and the other party members. Since pretty much all of the effects you get are pretty game-changing, this item can easily break a lot of parts of your game, unless you severely homebrew the item to make a lot of its effects not so ridiculous. It's also a good item to give the people at the end of a campaign when you don't care anymore, since at that point it's not a big deal if they gain 50,000 experience in a legendary item, or have all your magic items instantly disintegrated. And at number 3, we have the Luck Blade. The Luck Blade is a plus 1 legendary dagger, which basically gives you luck points similar to the Luck Feat in order to reroll basically any one roll that you don't like. It also has the option to cast the Wish spell up to three times. Now, the Wish spell is definitely one of the most powerful spells in the game, since it can allow you to do almost anything, assuming your DM allows it. As a baseline, it allows you to cast any spell level 8 or lower without spell materials, which can be pretty useful for using something like Simulacrum without all of the expensive materials, or its 12 hour cast time. There's also a handful of other effects you can use with Wish, like giving yourself 25,000 gold, healing up to 20 creatures to full health, and ending all negative effects on them, giving up to 10 people resistances to any one damage type, granting immunity to up to 10 creatures to a spell of your choice, or undoing a failed roll that was made in the last turn, even rewinding time in order to accomplish this. Although the real usefulness of this is the reality warping capabilities, where you can just ask for anything you can think of, and there's a chance that you can get it. Like, you could ask your DM for a legion of 25,000 fully armored warships, each one with an army of 50 berserkers who will fight at your command, and there's a chance you can just get that, which would allow you to win basically any encounter or conflict you might have for the rest of the game. Although most DMs are encouraged to not give you these things, and to instead monkey paw the wish in some way, but the potential is there, and it's pretty strong. Usually there's a whole bunch of negative effects to using Wish in any other way besides duplicating a spell, like the chance that you won't ever be able to cast it again. But if you use Wish from an item, you don't really have to worry about those negative effects, and you can just kind of do whatever you want. And at number 2, we have the Eye and Hand of Vecna. These items, which became available thanks to Descent into Avernus, are a pair of artifact items which grant you a whole bunch of different benefits. One of them is the ability to cast the Wish spell for free once every 30 days, which definitely beats out Luck Blade a little bit. But there is a lot of negative side effects to using these two items, so there's a chance you won't be able to do that. You see, in order to attune to the eye, you have to tear out your own eye first in order to place a new one in. And to attune to the hand, you must cut off your left hand and then shove the hand of Vecna into it so it can graft itself to the stump. And if the hand is ever removed, you die. You also have your alignment changed to true neutral, and then get a whole bunch of benefits like true sight, a strength score of 20, extra cold damage on every hit, and the ability to cast a whole bunch of spells like dominate monster, eye bite, disintegrate, finger of death, teleport, and a whole bunch of other really useful spells unlike the orb of dragon kind. But every time you use a spell from the eye, there's a 5% chance that Vecna will tear your soul from your body and take control of your character like a puppet. And every time you use a spell from the hand, 
it will cast a suggestion spell on you, demanding you to commit an evil act. Although definitely the strongest one is the ability to use a wish once every month. But it also has so many other great benefits, even if you never use any of the spells it can cast. As it also gives you regeneration, immunity to disease and poison, x-ray vision, the ability to instantly kill people by touching them with a failed DC 18 constitution save. If you don't mind your character being evil, and never wish to use any of the eye spells so that you don't have a 5% chance of instantly dying. There's still a lot of great benefits you can get, even if you completely avoid the abilities that have downsides to them. And the number one item on this list only beats out this combo because it doesn't require entombment. And at number one, we have the Ring of Three Wishes. This is an item that allows you to use the wish spell three times, and unlike the Luck Blade or Hand of Vecna, does not require you to attune to the item. So you can just have three wishes in your back pocket to use whenever you want without any hindrances or chance to have your soul instantly destroyed. Although the Ring of Three Wishes only has three wishes and does nothing else. Once you use them all up, the ring becomes non-magical. However, since it allows you to cast a wish, and since wish allows you to do basically whatever you want as long as the GM allows it, you could just wish for the ring to have all of its charges back with its last charge, and there is a chance that will happen. The chance is entirely decided by the DM though, and they can just tell you no, but it is absolutely something you're allowed to do, so you could just use two wishes like normal, and then use the last third wish to just wish for three more wishes, and have an infinite amount of wishes, and maybe use two of those wishes for 25,000 gold each, and just become super rich. Personally, I wouldn't allow this to happen without some kind of ridiculous percentile D100 roll, but that's just kind of the shenanigans that come about when you have the wish spell available to you. The reason spellcasters who gain the ability normally don't like to abuse it as much is because they have the chance to permanently lose the ability to cast wish if they use it on anything except copying spells. Wishes granted from items, though, don't have this downside, so you're kind of encouraged to use it in more creative ways when you gain the ability through an item. And being able to use three of them without an attunement is definitely one of the most powerful ways to obtain wishes. Which is why it's number one on this list. Honestly, the Hand of Vecna has a lot of other benefits in addition to one wish per month. But there's also a whole bunch of downsides to it. So I thought the non-attunement wish item was probably a little bit more useful and powerful. In this video, we're going over the best magic items that help you stay alive. By either making you harder to hit allowing you to avoid taking damage altogether, or just do something that improves the survivability of your character by a lot, with a big focus on items that are usable by every class. And at number 10, we have the Ring of Spell Storing. Now, at first glance, this doesn't really seem like a defensive magic item, as what it does is allow you to store five levels worth of spells inside the ring at a time, and any creature who's attuned to the item is able to cast the spells from the ring as if they cast it themselves, Although it uses the spell slot to level, spell save DC, spell attack bonus, and spell casting ability of the original caster. However, none of that really matters for how we're going to be using the Ring of Spell Storing for this video. Because what we care about are defensive magic items here. So the spells we're going to be putting into the Ring of Spell Storing are all reaction based. Specifically, low level reaction spells that have pretty much long lasting benefits all the way until tier 4 levels of play of nearly max level characters. And those spells are shield and absorb elements. Shield is a first level spell, whereas a reaction to getting hit by an attack or targeted by the magic missile spell, you gain a plus 5 bonus to your AC against the triggering attack, and you get to keep this plus 5 bonus to your AC until the start of your next turn, as well as taking no damage if you were targeted by magic missiles. The important part of shield is that bonus to your AC, which lasts for basically an entire round, so being able to cast shield once is going to make you very hard to hit. In fact, a static plus 5 bonus to your AC is useful at literally every single tier of play because that is a huge bonus to your AC for a turn. If you're playing a class that has a super high armor class already because of heavy armor, being able to add a plus 5 on top of that is going to make you unhittable outside of critical strikes. So if you just load a Ring of Spell Storing with 5 uses of shield and then hand it to a melee frontline user, this could be one of the best defensive magic items you could give them. And there's also Absorb Elements, which is really good, where you can use a reaction when you would take 5 common types of damage, where you gain resistance to that one damage type until the start of your next turn. So kind of like shield, you gain a really good benefit for basically a full round, where you just are taking half the damage from one common type of damage. And then you also get an extra benefit, where the first time you hit with a melee attack on your next turn, you deal an additional 1d6 damage to that target, based on the type of damage you became resistant to with absorb elements. So again, another great ring to fill a ring of spell storing in order to give to a melee frontline fighter, 
because being able to gain resistance to fire damage and then do a little bit of extra fire damage the next turn is pretty good. Shield is probably more usable in more scenarios than Absorb Elements, but both of these are excellent first level reaction spells to give a ring of spell story. Where if you're a DM and you're trying to hand out an item to make someone more survivable, all you have to do is load up a ring of spell story with three copies of shield and two uses of absorb elements, and they'll be set for a while before they need to find a spellcaster to recharge it. Or you can have one use of the third level spell counter spell, one use of shield and one use of absorb elements to hit the hat trick of useful reaction spells to anyone. Although since this is not a traditional defensive item, I only have it at the bottom of this list, because basically this is just a way to copy spellcasters a little bit, and the item could be purely used for non-defensive purposes as well. And at number 9, we have the Cloak of Protection. I guess also the Ring of Protection, as both of these magic items do the exact same thing. Where, while you're attuned to this item, you gain a plus 1 bonus to your AC, and a plus 1 bonus to all of your saving throws. And just a reminder that the Death Saving Throw is technically a saving throw, so this is one of the few ways to actually increase the chances of succeeding a death save. Now, I'm not sure why these two items are of different rarities when they both do the same thing, but whatever the case, they're both very simple items that just increase the defensive nature of whichever character is attuned to them. Being able to increase your AC by a plus one without any other kinds of restrictions is pretty rare, so it's super valuable. The mechanical benefits of just gaining one extra unconditional AC that's always on is so high that the Warforged race is considered one of the top 10 races to pick up because it has this one benefit as one of its racial bonuses. And being able to increase all of your saving throws by plus one is also pretty rare and powerful. The effects of both of these items are pretty generic and boring though, but they're also really strong on the number sides of things. Your characters will just be stronger if you have either of them, even if these items don't really have flashy bombastic effects. And at number 8 we have the Serpent Scale Armor from Candlekeep Mysteries. This magical armor is counted as scale mail, which is a type of medium armor that sets your AC to 14, plus additional AC based on your dexterity modifier but only to a maximum of 2. So what this means is if you have a 16 to your dexterity score, for example, which gives you a plus 3 modifier, then you'd only be able to add 2 extra AC to the scale mail, not the full 3 because it caps out, allowing the armor to grant a maximum of 16 AC if you have at least 14 dexterity. However, scale mail is also one of the armors that gives you disadvantage on your stealth checks, so it's kind of middle of the pack as far as armors go. Normally, scale mail is the best medium armor you can buy from a vendor without breaking the bank, as it only goes for 50 gold on average, whereas the next best medium armor, Breastplate, starts at 400 gold on average, and the one above that is 750 gold. However, this is magical scale armor, and the two benefits that this scale armor has is that it basically just allows you to add your full dexterity modifier to your extra AC instead of only two. And it removes the stealth disadvantage. So, not having stealth disadvantage is pretty nice, although you can gain the same benefits by just getting a breastplate instead. However, none of the other medium armors allow you to go past a plus two from the dexterity modifier. If you take the feat called Medium Armor Master, then you're allowed to go a plus three from your dexterity modifier instead of only two. However, this magic item allows you to go the full plus five if you have a 20 to your dexterity score. Then, this Serpent Scale Armor will allow you to have an impressive 19 AC, which is plus one higher than even Plate Armor, which is the most AC you can get from base armor. So, Serpent Scale Armor is a must-have if you're playing a class that can use medium armor, if you just want to have the best AC from a piece of equipment, outside of just getting one of the generic plus one magic armors. Because a Scale Armor on a class that has 20 dexterity is better than a plus three magical Scale Mail, which is considered a legendary item and Serpent Scale Armor is only uncommon quality. However, there are some other good armors. This list is only going to have a single spot on this list covering some of the special types of armors, so this is a good time to also mention some of the other ones, like the Elven Chain. This is a special medium armor chain shirt, which gives a plus one bonus to your AC while you wear it, and more importantly, considers you proficient in the armor even if you lack the medium armor proficiency. And of all of the baseline classes, six of them do not gain access to medium armor proficiencies unless they gain it through some other special feature or subclass. So Elven Chain is just a really good armor to give a class that normally doesn't get to wear anything outside of maybe light armor, as it can be better than any of those options. And finally, one of the best armors in the game is the Armor of Invulnerability, which is a legendary plate armor that passively makes you resistant to all non-magical damage and allows you to make yourself immune to all non-magical damage for 10 minutes once per day. Obviously, the Armor of Invulnerability is a good defensive item, 
I won't give it a place on this list because I'm kind of putting all of the mentions of the really good magical armors at this spot so that I can talk about a whole bunch of other things rather than listing all of the specific types of resistances and plus three armors as we go further on. And at number seven, we have the animated shield. This is a very rare shield which only has the effect where, as a bonus action, you can speak its command word in order to activate the shield, which gives you the benefits of having the shield equipped, but without having to use one of your hands to actually hold the shield, as it just kind of floats next to you and protects you like a normal shield would. Now, what's really useful about the animated shield is that it's always useful to have a shield on pretty much every class, since it just gives you a straight plus two bonus to your AC. But normally, you would need to use one of your hands in order to use it, which kind of causes all kinds of problems with spellcasters and melee fighters. A lot of the best weapons require both of your hands in order to use them, or to just dual wield, or even some of the spellcasting stuff requires both of your hands. Most classes want to hold a shield, they just don't have a free hand to do so, which is the main benefit of the animated shield. Always giving you the benefit of a shield without actually having to use one of your hands to do it. It does require a bonus action and only lasts for a minute, but you can use it as many times as you want per day to just have an extra plus two bonus to your AC. And getting even a plus one bonus to your AC is super valuable, so obviously an always on demand plus two is even better. And at number six, we have the Ghost Step Tattoo from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This one is a little bit unique in its defensive nature, as what it does is give you a tattoo that you can use three times per day, where as a bonus action you can become incorporeal until the end of your next turn. And while you're under this effect, you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, and you can't be grappled and restrained, and probably the most important aspect of it, you can move through creatures and solid objects as if they were difficult terrain. However, if you end your turn inside a solid object, you'll take some damage and then be pushed back out into the next unoccupied space. So, what's really good about this tattoo are two things. First up, gaining resistances to those three types of damage is really good because of the most common types of damage you can take. And usually they'll come from non-magical attacks if you're fighting creatures from the monster manual. And you gain the benefits for basically two turns, as you have the full benefits for your first turn after you use it, and then until the end of your next turn, as well as those turns in between those two turns, where other monsters are taking their turns and trying to attack you. And while this would be a pretty good defensive item for that benefit alone, what really makes this tattoo kind of overpowered is that ability to go through solid objects. If you're in any kind of dungeon or house or just an inside static location, being able to go incorporeal can be equivalent to not taking any damage. Because you can just go through a wall and end your turn on the other side of that wall, and then just come back for your turn because you keep the effect until the end of your next turn. So you can straight up have full cover during the effect of the Ghost Step Tattoo, and there's no better defensive item than not taking any damage at all. It also allows you to just completely skip all kinds of scenarios and puzzles outside of combat. Players should not have the ability to go incorporeal, and you'll find out real fast just how broken this is in a game once you gain access to it. Some of my players had the ability to go incorporeal during my Icewind Dale campaign, and skipped three chapters of the adventure because of it, especially being able to use it for two turns at a time and having three charges a day where it only requires your bonus action to activate. It's an incredibly convenient tattoo and is probably undervalued at only very rare quality. Although how useful being able to go through walls is, is pretty dependent on where you're actually able to use the item. So technically, it's kind of situational. If all your battles take place in an open field with no cover, then it's not very useful, which is why it's not at the top of this list, but still definitely in the top 10 nonetheless. And at number five, we have the Ring of Evasion. This ring has a special ability where if you fail a dexterity saving throw, you can use a reaction spend one charge of the ring in order to succeed on that saving throw instead. The ring has three charges and regains 1d3 every day, so you can use the ring of potential three times before it runs out of charges for the day. Now, here's what's really good with the Ring of Evasion. Most saving throws are dexterity based. If you're fighting an ancient red dragon who's hitting the entire party with a fire breath, that's a dexterity saving throw. Or normally, you would take enough damage to probably kill your character on a failure, you can instead use the Ring of Evasion to just immediately succeed, even though the DC is something like a 24. In fact, dexterity saving throws are probably the most used saving throw, period. And so being able to automatically succeed them is akin to having pseudo-legendary resistances, a feature that only boss monsters have, where they can automatically succeed three saving throws a day. You don't get to automatically succeed any saving throw, but if you were to only choose one type of saving throw that you were able to automatically succeed on, dexterity is definitely the best one you could pick. And it's even better if you're on a class which has the evasion feature, where you take no damage on a successful dexterity saving throw. And at number four, we have the Mantle of Spell Resistance. 
This is a cloak which simply has the effect that while you're attuned to the cloak, you have advantage on all saving throws against spells. There is also a similar shield called the Spell Guard Shield, which is one rarity higher and also gives you advantage against saving throws against spells, but extends its benefits to include magical effects and makes it so spell attacks have disadvantage against you as well. However, the Spell Guard Shield requires you to actually hold the shield, so it's not as universally useful as just the Mantle of Spell Resistance, which is probably easier to get since it's only of rare quality instead of very rare. But basically, both of these items are really good for the same reason. Being able to have advantage on all spell saves means you have a higher chance of succeeding spell saves. This is an ability that's so good that basically every boss monster has it by default in the monster manual, and some of the best races you can pick up are played because they have this ability by default, like the Yanti Pureblood or the Satyrs. However, they only work specifically on spells, so it's not as useful as magic resistance. But it's still a huge boost to your survivability to have advantage on saving throws against spells, because of just how strong spells are in D&D, where some spells can instantly disable your character, like a Banishment for example. If you fail a saving throw against a Banishment, that you're just out of the fight for a whole minute and there's nothing you can do about it. So being able to do the save at advantage can be the difference between completely losing the fight or being able to stay around long enough to stop the spellcaster from trying to cast it again. And at number three, we have the winged boots. This is only an uncommon quality item where you gain four hours of flight speed equal to your walking speed that you're able to use in increments of one minute each without requiring any actions on your part. So having winged boots basically allows your character to just fly at will. And what's really good about flying as a defensive magic item is the fact that a vast majority of creatures in the monster manual do not have ways to damage someone who's flying. Even something as scary as the CR-30 Tarrasque doesn't have a single ranged attack, or at least the 5e version. So if you have a level 1 ranger with a pair of winged boots and a magical longbow, they can solo Tarrasque by just flying out of range and pelting them with arrows until eventually some of them hit and whittle its health down to zero, since the 5e Tarrasque also doesn't have regeneration. The ability to fly in D&D is just super valuable, as it allows you to break a whole bunch of out-of-combat encounters too, kind of like the Ghost Step Tattoo. Although unlike the Ghost Step Tattoo, Winged Boots are also useful in an empty plane without anything to hide behind. They're just more useful in more situations, well, except maybe indoors where there's nowhere to fly. The Winged Boots are so useful that they're one of the most sought-after items in even Tier 4 levels of play, where characters are level 17 and above and are basically demigods. Even nearly max level characters loved winged boots for just having the ability to fly. So being literally unhittable by a majority of the monster manual is definitely a good defensive item. And even the monsters who do have a way to hit a flying target with a ranged attack, usually those monsters do a lot less damage than whatever their melee attacks would allow them to do. And at number two, we have the Cloak of Displacement. This is definitely one of the most sought after items that's only use is in its defense, where while you have the cloak, any creature that attacks you does so at disadvantage. However, if you take damage, the property of the cloak ceases to function until the start of your next turn, or if you're incapacitated, restrained, or otherwise unable to move. As what the cloak does is project an illusion that makes it appear as if you're standing near a location that you're actually standing, which is the flavor of why all the attacks are done at disadvantage against you. And just remember, attack is the D&D term for anything that requires a d20 attack roll, which includes all melee attacks and a lot of single target spells. If something requires a d20 attack roll in order to hit you, it's just done at disadvantage if you're wearing the cloak of displacement and disadvantage on attack rolls is really good for not getting hit, especially since you can wear the Cloak of Displacement on top of other items. So if you just have a Cloak of Displacement on top of a maxed out Serpent Scale armor, it's very possible for you to just never be hit during most combat encounters. So even though the Cloak stops functioning for a turn if you do get hit, there's just a good chance you won't get hit, as the average math for what disadvantage really means when it comes to increasing your AC is that it's basically equivalent to gaining an extra plus 5 AC, just at all times, kind of like casting a permanent shield. However, an effect that stacks with shield. If you have the ring of spell storing and you shield on an attack that might hit, adding the cloak of displacement on top of that is basically like having an extra plus 10 AC. It's not actually having a plus five AC, it's just kind of what having extra protection is similar to. And that's a very good to have as a passive item that doesn't require you to fly out of range or go through walls. And at number one, we have the cloak of invisibility. This is a legendary item that allows you to use an action in order to pull it over your head, which causes you to become invisible while you're wearing it. You can use the cloak in increments of one minute, similar to the winged boots, and you get a maximum duration of two hours per 12 hours that you don't use it. Although if you're only using it in combat, you basically never run out of uses of the cloak on an average adventuring day, and you'll be able to become fully invisible every combat. And what's really useful about the cloak of invisibility is that it's a type of invisibility which does not break upon attacking or casting a spell, like the second level spell invisibility does. 
And the benefits of being invisible in combat include, all attacks directed at you are done at disadvantage, just like the Cloak of Displacement. In addition, all attacks you do are done at advantage. And any spells or effects which require them to see a target don't work on you unless they have a way to see invisible targets. And you also have the ability to use your action to hide, since you permanently count it as heavily obscured. So the Cloak of Invisibility can give you all the benefits of the previous item on this list, while also giving you a whole bunch of combat offensive advantages as well, which doesn't turn off if you're actually hit by anything. In addition to the many uses you can get of the cloak outside of combat, where being able to go invisible is just incredibly useful in all kinds of situations. However, one benefit the Cloak of Displacement has over the Cloak of Invisibility is that you don't need to use an action in order to turn it on. So you do have to use your first action on your turn in order to go invisible, but the condition is so good that it's usually worth it. And the Cloak of Invisibility is one of the most sought after items in any level of play, including max level characters who have access to the spell Greater Invisibility, because it allows them to go invisible without having to use a spell slot or concentration.